Chapter twenty of Biographia Literaria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Chapter nineteen. Chapter twenty. The former subject continued. The neutral style, or that common to prose and poetry, exemplified by specimens from Chaucer, Herbert, and others. I have no fear in declaring my conviction that the excellence defined and exemplified in the preceding chapter is not the characteristic excellence of Mr. Wordsworth's style, because I can add, with equal sincerity, that it is precluded by higher powers. The praise of uniform adherence to genuine logical English is undoubtedly his. Nay, laying the main emphasis on the word uniform, I will dare add that, of all contemporary poets, it is his alone. For, in a less absolute sense of the word, I should certainly include Mr. Bowes, Lord Byron, and, as to all his later writings, Mr. Southey, the exceptions in their works being so few and unimportant. But of the specific excellence described in the quotation from Garber, I appear to find more and more undoubted specimens in the works of others, for instance among the minor poems of Mr. Thomas More, and of our illustrious laureate. To me it will always remain a singular and noticeable fact, that a theory which would establish this lingua communis not only as the best, but as the only commendable style, should have proceeded from a poet whose diction, next to that of Shakespeare and Milton, appears to me of all others the most individualised and characteristic. And let it be remembered, too, that I am now interpreting the controverted passages of Mr. Wordsworth's critical preface by the purpose and object which he may be supposed to have intended, rather than by the sense which the words themselves must convey, if they are taken without this allowance. A person of any taste who had but studied three or four of Shakespeare's principal plays would, without the name affixed, scarcely fail to recognise as Shakespeare's a quotation from any other play, though but of a few lines. A similar peculiarity, though in a less degree, attends Mr. Wordsworth's style, whenever he speaks in his own person, or whenever, though under a feigned name, it is clear that he himself is still speaking, as in the different dramatis personae of the recluse. Even in the other poems, in which he purposes to be most dramatic, there are few in which it does not occasionally burst forth. The reader might often address the poet in his own words, with reference to the persons introduced. It seems, as I retrace the ballad line by line, that but half of it is theirs, and the better half is thine. Who, having been previously acquainted with any considerable portion of Mr. Wordsworth's publications, and having studied them with a full feeling of the author's genius, would not at once claim as Wordsworthy and the little poem on the rainbow, the child is father of the man, etc., or in the Lucy Gray, no mate, no comrade Lucy knew, she dwelt on a wide moor, the sweetest thing that ever grew beside a human door. Or in the idle shepherd boys, along the river's stony marge, the sand lark chants a joyous song, the thrush is busy in the wood, and carols loud and strong, a thousand lambs are on the rocks, all newly born, both earth and sky, keep jubilee, and more than all, those boys with their green coronal. They never hear the cry, that plaintive cry, which up the hill, comes from the depth of Dungeon Gill. Need I mention the exquisite description of the sea-lock in the blind highland boy? Who but a poet tells a tale in such language to the little ones by the fireside as, Yet had he many a restless dream, both when he heard the eagles scream, and when he heard the torrents roar, and heard the water beat the shore, near where their cottage stood. Beside a lake their cottage stood, not small like ours, a peaceful flood, but one of mighty size and strange, that rough or smooth is full of change, and stirring in its bed. For to this lake, by night and day, the great sea-water finds its way, through long, long windings of the hills, and drinks up all the pretty rills, and rivers large and strong. Then hurries back the road it came, returns on errands still the same. This did it when the earth was new, and this for evermore will do, as long as earth shall last. And with the coming of the tide, come boats and ships that sweetly ride, between the woods and lofty rocks, and to the shepherds with their flocks bring tales of distant lands. I might quote almost the whole of his Ruth, but take the following stanzas. But, as you have before been told, this stripling sportive, gay and bold, and with his dancing crest, so beautiful through savage lands, had roamed about with vagrant bands of Indians in the west. The wind, the tempest roaring high, the tumult of a tropic sky, might well be dangerous food for him, a youth to whom was given so much of earth, so much of heaven, and such impetuous blood. Whatever in those climes he found, irregular in sight or sound, did to his mind impart 
a kindred impulse seemed allied to his own powers and justified the workings of his heart nor less to feed voluptuous thought the beauteous forms of nature wrought fair trees and lovely flowers the breezes their own languor lent the stars had feelings which they sent into those magic bowers yet in his worst pursuits i ween that sometimes there did intervene pure hopes of high intent for passions linked to form so fair and stately needs must have their share of noble sentiment but from mr wordsworth's more elevated compositions which already form three-fourths of his works and will i trust constitute hereafter a still larger proportion from these whether in rhyme or blank verse it would be difficult and almost superfluous to select instances of a diction peculiarly his own of a style which cannot be imitated without its being at once recognised as originating in mr wordsworth it would not be easy to open on any one of his loftier strains that does not contain examples of this and more in proportion as the lines are more excellent and most like the author for those who may happen to have been less familiar with his writings i will give three specimens taken with little choice the first from the lines on the boy of winandermere who blew mimic hootings to the silent owls that they might answer him and they would shout across the watery vale and shout again with long halloos and screams and echoes loud redoubled and redoubled concourse wild of mirth and jocund din and when it chanced that pauses of deep silence mocked his skill and sometimes in that silence while he hung listening a gentle shock of mild surprise has carried far into his heart the voice of mountain torrents or the visible scene would enter unawares into his mind with all its solemn imagery its rocks its woods and that uncertain heaven received into the bosom of the steady lake the second shall be that noble imitation of drayton if it was not rather a coincidence in the lines to joanna when i had gazed perhaps two minutes space joanna looking in my eyes beheld that ravishment of mine and laughed aloud the rock like something starting from a sleep took up the lady's voice and laughed again that ancient woman seated on helm crag was ready with her cavern hammer scar and the tall steep of silver house sent forth a noise of laughter southern longbrig heard and fairfield answered with a mountain tone helvellyn far into the clear blue sky carried the lady's voice old skiddor blew his speaking trumpet back out of the clouds from glaramara southward came the voice and kirkstone tossed it from its misty head the third which is in rhyme i take from the song at the feast of broom castle upon the restoration of lord clifford the shepherd to the estates and honours of his ancestors now another day is come fitter hope and nobler doom he hath thrown aside his crook and hath buried deep his book armour rusting in his halls on the blood of clifford calls quell the scot exclaims the lance bear me to the heart of france is the longing of the shield tell thy name thou trembling field field of death where'er thou be groan thou with our victory happy day and mighty hour when our shepherd in his power mailed and horsed with lance and sword to his ancestors restored like a reappearing star like a glory from afar first shall head the flock of war alas the fervent harper did not know that for a tranquil soul the lay was framed who long compelled in humble walks to go was softened into feeling soothed and tamed love had he found in huts where poor men lie his daily teachers had been woods and rills the silence that is in the starry sky the sleep that is among the lonely hills the words themselves in the foregoing extracts are no doubt sufficiently common for the greater part but in what poem are they not so if we accept a few misadventurous attempts to translate the arts and sciences into verse in the excursion the number of polysyllabic or what the common people call dictionary words is more than usually great and so must it needs be in proportion to the number and variety of an author's conceptions and his solicitude to express them with precision but are those words in those places commonly employed in real life to express the same thought or outward thing are they the style used in the ordinary intercourse of spoken words no nor are the modes of connections and still less the breaks and transitions would any but a poet at least could any one without being conscious that he had expressed himself with noticeable vivacity have described a bird singing loud by the thrush is busy in the wood or have spoken of boys with a string of club moss round their rusty hats as the boys with their green coronal or have translated a beautiful may day into both earth and sky keep jubilee or have brought all the different marks and circumstances of a sea-lock before the mind 
as the actions of a living and acting power, or have represented the reflection of the sky in the water as that uncertain heaven received into the bosom of the steady lake. Even the grammatical construction is not unfrequently peculiar, as the wind, the tempest roaring high, the tumult of a tropic sky, might well be dangerous food to him, a youth to whom was given, etc. There is a peculiarity in the frequent use of the asymataton, that is, the omission of the connective particle before the last of several words, or several sentences used grammatically as single words, all being in the same case and governing or governed by the same verb, and not less in the construction of words by apposition, to him a youth. In short, were they excluded from Mr. Wordsworth's poetic compositions, or that a little adherence to the theory of his preface would exclude, two-thirds at least of the marked beauties of his poetry must be erased, for a far greater number of lines would be sacrificed than in any other reason poet, because the pleasure received from Wordsworth's poems, being less derived either from excitement of curiosity or the rapid flow of narration, the striking passages form a larger proportion of their value. I do not adduce it as a fair criterion of comparative excellence, nor do I even think it such, but merely as matter of fact. I affirm that from no contemporary writer could so many lines be quoted without reference to the poem in which they are found, for their own independent weight or beauty. From the sphere of my own experience I can bring to my recollection three persons of no everyday powers and acquirements, who had read the poems of others with more and more unallied pleasure, and had thought more highly of their authors as poets, who yet have confessed to me that from no modern work had so many passages started up anew in their minds at different times, and as different occasions had awakened a meditative mood. End of chapter 20「Biographia Literaria」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Chapter 21 Remarks on the present mode of conducting critical journals. Long have I wished to see a fair and philosophical inquisition into the character of Wordsworth as a poet, on the evidence of his published works and a positive, not a comparative, appreciation of their characteristic excellencies, deficiencies, and defects. I know no claim that the mere opinion of any individual can have to weigh down the opinion of the author himself, against the probability of whose parental partiality we ought to set that of his having thought longer and more deeply on the subject, but I should call that investigation fair and philosophical, in which the critic announces and endeavours to establish the principles which he holds for the foundation of poetry in general, with the specification of these in their application to the different classes of poetry. Having thus prepared his canons of criticism for praise and condemnation, he would proceed to particularise the most striking passages to which he deems them applicable, faithfully noticing the frequent or infrequent recurrence of similar merits or defects, and as faithfully distinguishing what is characteristic from what is accidental, or a mere flagging of the wing. Then, if his premises be rational, his deductions legitimate, and his conclusions justly applied, the reader, and possibly the poet himself, may adopt his judgment in the light of judgment, and in the independence of free agency. If he has erred, he presents his errors in a definite place and tangible form, and holds the torch, and guides the way to their detection. I most willingly admit, and estimate at a high value, the services which the Edinburgh Review and others formed afterwards on the same plan, have rendered to society in the diffusion of knowledge. I think the commencement of the Edinburgh Review an important epoch in periodical criticism, and that it has a claim upon the gratitude of the literary republic, and indeed of the reading public at large, for having originated the scheme of reviewing those books only which are susceptible and deserving of argumentative criticism, not less meritorious and far more faithfully, and in general far more ably executed, is their plan of supplying the vacant place of the trash or mediocrity wisely left to sink into oblivion by its own weight with original essays on the most interesting subjects of the time, religious or political, in which the titles of the books or pamphlets prefixed furnish only the name and occasion of the disquisition. I do not arraign the keenness or asperity of its damnatory style, in and for itself, as long as the author is addressed or treated as the mere impersonation of the work then under trial. I have no quarrel with them on this account, as long as no personal allusions are admitted, and no recommitment for new trial of juvenile performances that were published perhaps forgotten many years before the commencement of the review 
since for the forcing back of such works to public notice no motives are easily assignable but such as are furnished to the critic by his own personal malignity or what is still worse by a habit of malignity in the form of mere wantonness no private grudge they need no personal spite the viva sectio is its own delight all enmity all envy they disclaim disinterested thieves of our good name cool sober murderers of their neighbour's fame s t c every censure every sarcasm respecting a publication which the critic with the criticised work before him can make good is the critic's right the writer is authorised to reply but not to complain neither can any one prescribe to the critic how soft or how hard how friendly or how bitter shall be the phrases which he is to select for the expression of such reprehension or ridicule the critic must know what effect it is his object to produce and with a view to this effect must he weigh his words but as soon as the critic betrays that he knows more of his author than the author's publications could have told him as soon as from this more intimate knowledge elsewhere obtained he avails himself of the slightest trait against the author his censure instantly becomes personal injury his sarcasms personal insults he ceases to be a critic and takes on him the most contemptible character to which a rational creature can be degraded that of a gossip backbiter and pasquillant but with this heavy aggravation that he steals the unquiet the deforming passions of the world into the museum into the very place which next to the chapel and oratory should be our sanctuary and secure place of refuge offers abominations on the altar of the muses and makes its sacred paling the very circle in which he conjures up the lying and profane spirit this determination of unlicensed personality and of permitted and legitimate censure which i owe in part to the illustrious lessing himself a model of acute spirited sometimes stinging but always argumentative and honourable criticism is beyond controversy the true one and though i would not myself exercise all the rights of the latter yet let but the former be excluded i submit myself to its exercise in the hands of others without complaint and without resentment let a communication be formed between any number of learned men in the various branches of science and literature and whether the president and central committee be in london or edinburgh if only they previously lay aside their individuality and pledge themselves inwardly as well as ostensibly to administer judgment according to a constitution and code of laws and if by grounding this code on the twofold basis of universal morals and philosophic reason independent of all foreseen application to particular works and authors they obtain the right to speak each as the representative of their body corporate they shall have honour and good wishes from me and i shall accord to them their fair dignities though self-assumed not less cheerfully than if i could inquire concerning them in the herald's office or turn to them in the book of peerage however loud may be the outcries for a prevented or subverted reputation however numerous and impatient the complaints of merciless severity and insupportable despotism i shall neither feel nor utter aught but to the defence and justification of the critical machine should any literary quixote find himself provoked by its sounds and regular movements i should admonish him with sancho panza that it is no giant but a windmill there it stands on its own place and its own hillock never goes out of its way to attack any one and to none and from none either gives or asks assistance when the public press has poured in any part of its produce between its millstones it grinds it off one man's sack the same as another and with whatever wind may happen to be then blowing all the two-and-thirty winds are alike its friends of the whole wide atmosphere it does not desire a single finger-breath more than what is necessary for its sails to turn round in but this space must be left free and unimpeded gnats beetles wasps butterflies and the whole tribe of ephemerals and insignificance may flit in and out and between may hum and buzz and jar may shrill their tiny pipes and whine their puny horns unchastised and unnoticed but idlers and bravados of larger size and prouder show must beware how they place themselves within its sweep much less may they presume to lay hands on the sails the strength of which is neither greater nor less than as the wind is which drives them round whomsoever the remorseless arm slings aloft or whirls along with it in the air he has himself alone to blame though when the same arm throws him from it it will more often double than break the force of his fall putting aside the too manifest and too frequent interference of national party and even personal predilection or aversion and reserving for deeper feelings those worse and more criminal intrusions into the sacredness of private life which not seldom merit legal rather than literary chastisement the two principal objects and occasions which i find for blame and regret in the conduct of the review in question are first its unfaithfulness to its own announced and excellent plan by subjecting to criticism works neither indecent nor immoral yet of such trifling importance even in point of size and according to the critic's own verdict so devoid of all merit 
as must excite in the most candid mind the suspicion either that dislike or vindictive feelings were at work or that there was a cold prudential predetermination to increase the sale of the review by flattering the malignant passions of human nature that i may not myself become subject to the charge which i am bringing against others by an accusation without proof i refer to the article on dr reynolds sermon in the very first number of the edinburgh review as an illustration of my meaning if in looking through all the succeeding volumes the reader should find this a solitary instance i must submit to that painful forfeiture of esteem which awaits a groundless or exaggerated charge the second point of objection belongs to this review only in common with all other works of periodical criticism at least it applies in common to the general system of all whatever exception there may be in favour of particular articles or if it attaches to the edinburgh review and to its only co-rival the quarterly with any peculiar force this results from the superiority of talent acquirement and information which both have so undeniably displayed and which doubtless deepens the regret though not the blame i am referring to the substitution of assertion for argument to the frequency of arbitrary and sometimes petulant verdicts not seldom unsupported even by a single quotation from the work condemned which might at least have explained the critic's meaning if it did not prove the justice of his sentence even where this is not the case the extracts are too often made without reference to any general grounds or rules from which the faultiness or inadmissibility of the qualities attributed may be deduced and without any attempt to show that the qualities are attributable to the passage extracted i have met with such extracts from mr wordsworth's poems annexed to such assertions as led me to imagine that the reviewer having written his critique before he had read the work had then pricked with a pin for passages wherewith to illustrate the various branches of his preconceived opinions by what principle of rational choice can we suppose a critic to have been directed at least in a christian country and himself we hope a christian who gives the following lines portraying the fervour of solitary devotion excited by the magnificent display of the almighty's works as a proof and example of an author's tendency to downright ravings and absolute unintelligibility o oh, then what soul was his when on the tops of the high mountains he beheld the sun rise up and bathe the world in light he looked ocean and earth the solid frame of earth and ocean's liquid mass beneath him lay in gladness and deep joy the clouds were touched and in their silent faces did he read unutterable love sound needed none nor any voice of joy his spirit drank the spectacle sensation soul and form all melted into him they swallowed up his animal being in them did he live and by them did he live they were his life can it be expected that either the author or his admirers should be induced to pay any serious attention to decisions which prove nothing but the pitiable state of the critic's own taste and sensibility on opening the review they see a favourite passage of the force and truth of which they had an intuitive certainty in their own inward experience confirmed if confirmation it could receive by the sympathy of their most enlightened friends some of whom perhaps even in the world's opinion hold a higher intellectual rank than the critic himself would presume to claim and this very passage they find selected as the characteristic effusion of a mind deserted by reason as furnishing evidence that the writer was raving or he could not have thus strung words together without sense or purpose no diversity of taste seems capable of explaining such a contrast in judgment that i had overrated the merit of a passage or poem that i had erred concerning the degree of its excellence i might be easily induced to believe or apprehend but that lines the sense of which i had analysed and found consonant with all the best convictions of my understanding and the imagery and diction of which had collected round those convictions my noblest as well as my most delightful feelings that i should admit such lines to be mere nonsense or lunacy is too much for the most ingenious arguments to effect but that such a revolution of taste should be brought about by a few broad assertions seems little less than impossible on the contrary it would require an effort of charity not to dismiss the criticism with the aphorism of the wise man in animam malevolam sapientia haud intrare potest what then if this very critic should have cited a large number of single lines and even of long paragraphs which he himself acknowledges to possess eminent and original beauty what if he himself has owned that beauties as great are scattered in abundance throughout the whole book and yet though under this impression should have commenced his critique in vulgar exultation with a prophecy meant to secure its own fulfilment with a this won't do what if after such acknowledgments extorted from his own judgment he should proceed from charge to charge of tameness and raving flights and flatness and at length consigning the author to the house of incurables should conclude with a strain of rudest contempt evidently grounded in the distempered state of his own moral associations suppose too all this done without a single leading principle established or even announced and without any one attempt at argumentative deduction 
though the poet had presented a more than usual opportunity for it by having previously made public his own principles of judgment in poetry and supported them by a connected train of reasoning the office and duty of the poet is to select the most dignified as well as the gayest happiest attitude of things the reverse for in all cases the reverse is possible is the appropriate business of burlesque and travesty a predominant taste for which has been always deemed a mark of a low and degraded mind when i was at rome among many other visits to the tomb of julius the second i went thither once with a prussian artist a man of genius and great vivacity of feeling as we were gazing on michelangelo's moses our conversation turned on the horns and beard of that stupendous statue of the necessity of each to support the other of the superhuman effect of the former and the necessity of the existence of both to give a harmony and integrity both to the image and the feeling excited by it conceive them removed and the statue would become unnatural without being supernatural we call to mind the horns of the rising sun and i repeated the noble passage from taylor's holy dying that horns were the emblem of power and sovereignty among the eastern nations and are still retained as such in abyssinia the achilleus of the ancient greeks and the probable ideas and feelings that originally suggested the mixture of the human and the brute form in the figure by which they realized the idea of their mysterious pan as representing intelligence blended with a darker power deeper mightier and more universal than the conscious intellect of man than intelligence all these thoughts and recollections passed in procession before our minds my companion who possessed more than his share of the hatred which his countrymen bore to the french had just observed to me a frenchman sir is the only animal in the human shape that by no possibility can lift itself up to religion or poetry when lo two french officers of distinction and rank enter the church mark you whispered the prussian the first thing which those scoundrels will notice for they will begin by instantly noticing the statue in parts without one moment's pause of admiration impressed by the whole will be the horns and the beard and the associations which they will immediately connect with them will be those of a he-goat and a cuckold never did man guess more luckily had he inherited a portion of the great legislator's prophetic powers whose statue we had been contemplating he could scarcely have uttered words more coincident with the result for even as he had said so it came to pass in the excursion the poet has introduced an old man born in humble but not abject circumstances who had enjoyed more than usual advantages of education both from books and from the more awful discipline of nature this person he represents as having been driven by the restlessness of fervid feelings and from a craving intellect to an itinerant life and as having in consequence passed the larger portion of his time from earliest manhood in villages and hamlets from door to door a vagrant merchant bent beneath his load now whether this be a character appropriate to a lofty didactic poem is perhaps questionable it presents a fair subject for controversy and the question is to be determined by the congruity or incongruity of such a character with what shall be proved to be the essential constituents of poetry but surely the critic who passing by all the opportunities which such a mode of life would present to such a man all the advantages of the liberty of nature of solitude and of solitary thought all the varieties of places and seasons through which his track had lain with all the varying imagery they bring with them and lastly all the observations of men their manners their enjoyments and pursuits their passions and their feelings which the memory of these yearly journeys must have given and recalled to such a mind the critic i say who from the multitude of possible associations should pass by all these in order to fix his attention exclusively on the pin-papers and stay-tapes which might have been among the wares of his pack this critic in my opinion cannot be thought to possess a much higher or much healthier state of moral feeling than the frenchman above recorded End of chapter 21if mr wordsworth have set forth principles of poetry which his arguments are insufficient to support let him and those who have adopted his sentiments be set right by the confutation of those arguments and by the substitution of more philosophical principles and still let the due credit be given to the portion and importance of the truths which are blended with his theory 
truths the too exclusive attention to which had occasioned its errors by tempting him to carry those truths beyond their proper limits if his mistaken theory have at all influenced his poetic compositions let the effects be pointed out and the instances given but let it likewise be shown how far the influence has acted whether diffusively or only by starts whether the number and importance of the poems and passages thus infected be great or trifling compared with the sound portion and lastly whether they are inwoven into the texture of his works or are loose and separable the result of such a trial would evince beyond a doubt what it is high time to announce decisively and aloud that the supposed characteristics of mr wordsworth's poetry whether admired or reprobated whether they are simplicity or simpleness faithful adherence to essential nature or wilful selections from human nature of its meanest forms and under the least attractive associations are as little the real characteristics of his poetry at large as of his genius and the constitution of his mind in a comparatively small number of poems he chose to try an experiment and this experiment we will suppose to have failed yet even in these poems it is impossible not to perceive that the natural tendency of the poet's mind is to great objects and elevated conceptions the poem entitled fidelity is for the greater part written in language as unraised and naked as any perhaps in the two volumes yet take the following stanza and compare it with the preceding stanzas of the same poem there sometimes doth a leaping fish send through the tarn a lonely cheer the crags repeat the raven's croak in symphony austere thither the rainbow comes the cloud and mist that spread the flying shroud and sunbeams and the sounding blast that if it could would hurry past but that enormous barrier holds it fast or compare the four last lines of the concluding stanza with the former half yes proof was plain that since the day on which the traveller thus had died the dog had watched about the spot or by his master's side how nourished here through such long time he knows who gave that love sublime and gave that strength of feeling great above all human estimate can any candid and intelligent mind hesitate in determining which of these best represents the tendency and native character of the poet's genius will he not decide that the one was written because the poet would so write and the other because he could not so entirely repress the force and grandeur of his mind but that he must in some part or other of every composition write otherwise in short that his only disease is the being out of his element like the swan that having amused himself for a while with crushing the weeds on the river's bank soon returns to his own majestic movements on its reflecting and sustaining surface let it be observed that i am here supposing the imagined judge to whom i appeal to have already decided against the poet's theory as far as it is different from the principles of the art generally acknowledged i cannot here enter into a detailed examination of mr wordsworth's works but i will attempt to give the main results of my own judgment after an acquaintance of many years and repeated perusals and though to appreciate the defects of a great mind it is necessary to understand previously its characteristic excellences yet i have already expressed myself with sufficient fulness to preclude most of the ill effects that might arise from my pursuing a contrary arrangement i will therefore commence with what i deem the prominent defects of his poems hitherto published the first characteristic though only occasional defect which i appear to myself to find in these poems is the inconstancy of the style under this name i refer to the sudden and unprepared transitions from lines or sentences of peculiar felicity at all events striking and original to a style not only unimpassioned but undistinguished he sinks too often and too abruptly to that style which i should place in the second division of language dividing it into the three species first that which is peculiar to poetry second that which is only proper in prose and third the neutral or common to both there have been works such as cowley's essay on cromwell in which prose and verse are intermixed not as in the consolation of boetius or the argenis of Berkeley, by the insertion of poems supposed to have been spoken or composed on occasions previously related in prose but the poet passing from one to the other as the nature of the thoughts or his own feelings dictated yet this mode of composition does not satisfy a cultivated taste there is something unpleasant in the being thus obliged to alternate states of feeling so dissimilar and this too in a species of writing the pleasure from which is in part derived from the preparation and previous expectation of the reader a portion of that awkwardness is felt which hangs upon the introduction of songs in our modern comic operas and to prevent which the judicious metastasia as to whose exquisite taste there can be no hesitation whatever doubts may be entertained as to his poetic genius 
uniformly plays the aria at the end of the scene, at the same time that he almost always raises and impassions the style of the recitative immediately preceding. Even in real life the difference is great and evident between words used as the arbitrary marks of thought, our smooth market coin of intercourse, with the image and superscription worn out by currency, and those which convey pictures either borrowed from one outward object to enliven and particularize some other, or used allegorically to body forth the inward state of the person speaking, or such as are at least the exponents of his peculiar turn and unusual extent of faculty. So much so, indeed, that in the social circles of private life we often find a striking use of the latter put a stop to the general flow of conversation, and by the excitement arising from consented attention produce a sort of damp and interruption for some minutes after. But in the perusal of works of literary art, we prepare ourselves for such language, and the business of the writer, like that of a painter, whose subject requires unusual splendour and prominence, is so to raise the lower and neutral tints, that what in a different style would be the commanding colours, are here used as the means of that gentle degradation requisite, in order to produce the effect of a whole. Where this is not achieved in a poem, the metre merely reminds the reader of his claims, in order to disappoint them, and where this defect occurs frequently, his feelings are alternately startled by anticlimax and hyperclimax. I refer the reader to the exquisite stanza cited for another purpose from the blind highland boy, and then annex as being, in my opinion, instances of this disharmony in style, the two following. And one, the rarest, was a shell, which he, poor child, had studied well, the shell of a green turtle, thin and hollow, you might sit therein, it was so wide and deep. Our highland boy oft visited the house which held this prize, and led, by choice or chance did thither come one day when no one was at home, and found the door unbarred. Or page 172, volume 1. Tis gone forgotten, let me do my best. There was a smile or two. I can remember them, I see the smiles worth all the world to me. Dear baby, I must lay thee down. Thou troublest me with strange alarms. Smiles hast thou, sweet ones of thine own. I cannot keep thee in my arms, for they confound me as it is. I have forgot those smiles of his or page 269, volume 1, Thou hast a nest for thy love and thy rest, and though little troubled with sloth, drunken lark, thou wouldst be loath to be such a traveller as I, happy, happy liver, with a soul as strong as a mountain river, pouring out praise to the almighty giver, joy and jollity be with us both, hearing thee or else some other, as merry a brother, I on the earth will go plodding on, by myself cheerfully, till the day is done. The incongruity which I appear to find in this passage is that of the two noble lines in italics with the preceding and following. So volume 2, page 30. Close by a pond, upon the further side, he stood alone a minute's space, I guess. I watched him, he continuing motionless, to the pool's further margin than I drew, he being all the while before me full in view. Compare this with the repetition of the same image, the next stanza but two. And still as I drew near with gentle pace, beside the little pond or moorish flood, motionless as a clod the old man stood, that heareth not the loud winds when they call, and moveth altogether, if it move at all. Or lastly, the second of the three following stanzas, compared both with the first and the third. My former thoughts returned, the fear that kills, and hope that is unwilling to be fed, cold pain and labour, and all fleshly ills, and mighty poets in their misery dead. But now perplexed by what the old man had said, my question eagerly did I renew, How is it that you live, and what is it you do? He with a smile did then his words repeat, and said that gathering leeches far and wide, he travels, stirring thus about his feet, the waters of the ponds where they abide. Once I could meet with them on every side, but they have dwindled long by slow decay, yet still I persevere and find them where I may. While he was talking thus the lonely place, the old man's shape and speech all troubled me. In my mind's eye I seemed to see him pace, about the weary moors, continually, wandering about alone and silently. Indeed, this fine poem is especially characteristic of the author. There is scarce a defect or excellence in his writings of which it would not present a specimen, but it would be unjust not to repeat that this defect is only occasional. From a careful reperusal of the two volumes of poems, I doubt whether the objectionable passages would amount in the whole to one hundred lines, not the eighth part of the number of pages. In the excursion, the feeling of incongruity is seldom excited by the diction of any passage considered in itself, but by the sudden superiority of some other passage forming the content. The second defect I can generalise with tolerable accuracy, if the reader will pardon an uncouth and new-coined word. There is, I should say, not seldom a matter of factness in certain poems. This may be divided into first, 
a laborious minuteness and fidelity in the representation of objects and their positions as they appeared to the poet himself secondly the insertion of accidental circumstances in order to the full explanation of his living characters their dispositions and actions which circumstances might be necessary to establish the probability of a statement in real life where nothing is taken for granted by the hearer but appears superfluous in poetry where the reader is willing to believe for his own sake to this accidentality i object as contravening the essence of poetry which aristotle pronounces to be swidiotaton kai philosophotaton genos the most intense weighty and philosophical product of human art adding as the reason that it is the most catholic and abstract the following passage from davenant's prefatory letter to hobbes well expresses this truth when i considered the actions which i meant to describe those inferring the persons i was again persuaded rather to choose those of a former age than the present and in a century so far removed as might preserve me from their improper examinations who know not the requisites of a poem nor how much pleasure they lose and even the pleasure of heroic poesy are not unprofitable who take away the liberty of a poet and fetter his feet in the shackles of an historian for why should a poet doubt in story to mend the intrigues of fortune by more delightful conveyances of probable fictions because austere historians have entered into bond to truth an obligation which were in poets as foolish and unnecessary as is the bondage of false martyrs who lie in chains for a mistaken opinion but by this i would imply that truth narrative and past is the idol of historians who worship a dead thing and truth operative and by effects continually alive is the mistress of poets who hath not her existence in matter but in reason for this minute accuracy in the painting of local imagery the lines in the excursion pages ninety six ninety seven and ninety eight may be taken if not as a striking instance yet as an illustration of my meaning it must be some strong motive as for instance that the description was necessary to the intelligibility of the tale which could induce me to describe in a number of verses what a draughtsman could present to the eye with incomparably greater satisfaction by half a dozen strokes of his pencil or the painter with as many touches of his brush such descriptions too often occasion in the mind of a reader who is determined to understand his author a feeling of labour not very dissimilar to that with which he would construct a diagram line by line for a long geometrical proposition it seems to be like taking the pieces of a dissected map out of its box we first look at one part and then at another then join and dovetail them and when the successive acts of attention have been completed there is a retrogressive effort of mind to behold it as a whole the poet should paint to the imagination not to the fancy and i know no happier case to exemplify the distinction between these two faculties masterpieces of the former mode of poetic painting abound in the writings of milton for example the fig tree not that kind for fruit renowned but such as at this day to indians known in malabar or deccan spreads her arms branching so broad and long that in the ground the bended twigs take root and daughters grow about the mother tree a pillared shade high overarched and echoing walks between there off the indian herdsman shunning heat shelters in cool and tends his pasturing herds at hoop-holes cut through thickest shade this is creation rather than painting or if painting yet such and with such co-presence of the whole picture flashed at once upon the eye as the sun paints in a camera obscura but the poet must likewise understand and command what bacon calls the vestigia communia of the senses the latency of all in each and more especially as by a magical penny duplex the excitement of vision by sound and the exponents of sound thus the echoing walks between may be almost said to reverse the fable in tradition of the head of memnon in the egyptian statue such may be deservedly entitled the creative words in the world of imagination the second division respects an apparent minute adherence to matter of fact in character and incidents a biographical attention to probability and an anxiety of explanation and retrospect under this head i shall deliver with no feigned dividends the results of my best reflection on the great point of controversy between mr wordsworth and his objectors namely on the choice of his characters i have already declared and i trust justified my utter dissent from the mode of argument which his critics have hitherto employed to their question why did you choose such a character or a character from such a rank of life the poet might in my opinion fairly retort why with the conception of my character did you make wilful choice of mean or ludicrous associations not furnished by me but supplied from your own sickly and fastidious feelings how was it indeed probable that such arguments could have any weight with an author whose plan whose guiding principle and main object it was to attack and subdue that state of association which leads us to place the chief value on those things on which man differs from man and to forget or disregard the high dignities which belong to human nature 
the sense and the feeling which may be and ought to be found in all ranks the feelings with which as christians we contemplate a mixed congregation rising or kneeling before their common maker mr wordsworth would have us entertain at all times as men and as readers and by the excitement of this lofty yet prideless impartiality in poetry he might hope to have encouraged its continuance in real life the praise of good men be his in real life and i trust even in my imagination i honour a virtuous and wise man without reference to the presence or absence of artificial advantages whether in the person of an armed baron a laurelled bard or of an old peddler or still older leech-gatherer the same qualities of head and heart must claim the same reverence and even in poetry i am not conscious that i have ever suffered my feelings to be disturbed or offended by any thoughts or images which the poet himself has not presented but yet i object nevertheless and for the following reasons first because the object in view as an immediate object belongs to the moral philosopher and would be pursued not only more appropriately but in my opinion with far greater probability of success in sermons or moral essays than in an elevated poem it seems indeed to destroy the main fundamental distinction not only between a poem and prose but even between philosophy and works of fiction inasmuch as it proposes truth for its immediate object instead of pleasure now till the blessed time shall come when truth itself shall be pleasure and both shall be so united as to be distinguishable in words only not in feeling it will remain the poet's office to proceed upon that state of association which actually exists as general instead of attempting first to make it what it ought to be and then to let the pleasure follow but here is unfortunately a small hysteron proteron for the communication of pleasure is the introductory means by which alone the poet must expect to moralize his readers secondly though i were to admit for a moment this argument to be groundless yet how is the moral effect to be produced by merely attaching the name of some low profession to powers which are least likely and to qualities which are assuredly not more likely to be found in it the poet speaking in his own person may at once delight and improve us by sentiments which teach us the independence of goodness of wisdom and even of genius on the favours of fortune and having made a due reverence before the throne of antonine he may bow with equal awe before epictetus among his fellow-slaves and rejoice in the plain presence of his dignity who is not at once delighted and improved when the poet wordsworth himself exclaims o oh, many are the poets that are sown by nature men endowed with highest gifts the vision and the faculty divine yet wanting the accomplishment of verse nor having e'er as life advanced been led by circumstance to take unto the height the measure of themselves these favoured beings all but a scattered few live out their time husbanding that which they possess within and go to the grave unthought of strongest minds are often those of whom the noisy world hears least to use a colloquial phrase such sentiments in such language do one's heart good though i for my part have not the fullest faith in the truth of the observation on the contrary i believe the instances to be exceedingly rare and should feel almost as strong an objection to introduce such a character in a poetic fiction as a pair of black swans on a lake in a fancy landscape when i think how many and how much better books than homer or even than herodotus pindar or aeschylus could have read are in the power of almost every man in a country where almost every man is instructed to read and write and how restless how difficultly hidden the powers of genius are and yet find even in situations the most favourable according to mr wordsworth for the formation of a pure and poetic language in situations which ensure familiarity with the grandest objects of the imagination but one burns among the shepherds of scotland and not a single poet of humble life among those of english lakes and mountains i conclude that poetic genius is not only a very delicate but a very rare plant but be this as it may the feelings with which i think of chatterton the marvellous boy the sleepless soul that perished in his pride of burns who walked in glory and in joy behind his plough upon the mountain side are widely different from those with which i should read a poem where the author having occasion for the character of a poet and a philosopher in the fable of his narration had chosen to make him a chimney-sweeper and then in order to remove all doubts on the subject had invented an account of his birth parentage and education with all the strange and fortunate accidents which had concurred in making him at once poet philosopher and sweep nothing but biography can justify this if it be admissible even in a novel it must be one in the manner of defoe's that were meant to pass for histories not in the manner of fieldings in the life of moll flanders or colonel jack not in a tom jones or even a joseph andrews much less then can it be legitimately introduced in a poem the characters of which amid the strongest individualization must still remain representative the precepts of horace on this point are grounded on the nature both of poetry and of the human mind they are not more peremptory than wise and prudent for in the first place 
a deviation from them perplexes the reader's feelings and all the circumstances which are feigned in order to make such accidents less improbable divide and disquiet his faith rather than aid and support it spite of all attempts the fiction will appear and unfortunately not as fictitious but as false the reader not only knows that the sentiments and language are the poet's own and his own too in his artificial character as poet but by the fruitless endeavours to make him think the contrary he is not even suffered to forget it the effect is similar to that produced by an epic poet when the fable and the characters are derived from scripture history as in the messiah of klopstock or in cumberland's calvary and not merely suggested by it as in the paradise lost of milton that illusion contradistinguished from delusion that negative faith which simply permits the images presented to work by their own force without either denial or affirmation of their real existence by the judgment is rendered impossible by their immediate neighbourhood to words and facts of known and absolute truth a faith which transcends even historic belief must absolutely put out this mere poetic analogon of faith as the summer sun is said to extinguish our household fires when it shines full upon them what would otherwise have been yielded to as pleasing fiction is repelled as revolting falsehood the effect produced in this latter case by the solemn belief of the reader is in a less degree brought about in the instances to which i have been objecting by the balked attempts of the author to make him believe add to all the foregoing the seeming uselessness both of the project and of the anecdotes from which it is to derive support is there one word for instance attributed to the peddler in the excursion characteristic of a peddler one sentiment that might not more plausibly even without the aid of any previous explanation have proceeded from any wise and beneficent old man of a rank or profession in which the language of learning and refinement are natural and to be expected need the rank have been at all particularized where nothing follows which the knowledge of that rank is to explain or illustrate when on the contrary this information renders the man's language feeling sentiments and information a riddle which must itself be solved by episodes of anecdote finally when this and this alone could have induced a genuine poet to imweave in a poem of the loftiest style and on subjects the loftiest and of the most universal interest such minute matters of fact not unlike those furnished for the obituary of a magazine by the friends of some obscure ornament of society lately deceased in some obscure town as among the hills of athol he was born there on a small hereditary farm an unproductive slip of rugged ground his father dwelt and died in poverty while he whose lowly fortune i retrace the youngest of three sons was yet a babe a little one unconscious of their loss but ere he had outgrown his infant days his widowed mother for a second mate espoused the teacher of the village school who on her offspring zealously bestowed needful instruction from his sixth year the boy of whom i speak in summer tended cattle on the hills but through the inclement and the perilous days of long continuing winter he repaired to his stepfather's school etc for all the admirable passages interposed in this narration might with trifling alterations have been far more appropriately and with far greater verisimilitude told of a poet in the character of a poet and without incurring another defect which i shall now mention and a sufficient illustration of which will have been here anticipated third an undue predilection for the dramatic form in certain poems from which one or other of two evils result either the thoughts and diction are different from that of the poet and then there arises an incongruity of style or they are the same and indistinguishable and then it presents a species of ventriloquism where two are represented as talking while in truth one man only speaks the fourth class of defects is closely connected with the former but yet are such as arise likewise from an intensity of feeling disproportionate to such knowledge and value of the objects described as can be fairly anticipated of men in general even of the most cultivated classes and with which therefore few only and those few particularly circumstanced can be supposed to sympathize in this class i comprise occasional prolixity repetition and an eddying instead of progression of thought as instances see pages twenty seven twenty eight and sixty two of the poems volume one and the first eighty lines of the sixth book of the excursion fifth and last thoughts and images too great for the subject this is an approximation to what might be called mental bombast as distinguished from verbal for as in the latter there is a disproportion of the expressions to the thoughts so in this there is a disproportion of thought to the circumstance and occasion this by the by is a fault of which none but a man of genius is capable it is the awkwardness and strength of hercules with the distaff of omphala it is a well-known fact that bright colours in motion both make and leave the strongest impressions on the eye nothing is more likely too than that a vivid image or visual spectrum thus originated may become the link of association in recalling the feelings and images that had accompanied the original impression but if we describe this in such lines as 
they flash upon that inward eye which is the bliss of solitude in what words shall we describe the joy of retrospection when the images and virtuous actions of a whole well-spent life pass before that conscience which is indeed the inward eye which is indeed the bliss of solitude assuredly we seem to sink most abruptly not to say burlesquely and almost as in a medley from this couplet to and then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils volume one page three hundred and twenty eight the second instance is from volume two page twelve where the poet having gone out for a day's tour of pleasure meets early in the morning with a knot of gypsies who had pitched their blanket tents and straw beds together with their children and asses in some field by the roadside at the close of the day on his return our tourists found them in the same place twelve hours says he twelve hours twelve bounteous hours are gone while i have been a traveller under open sky much witnessing of change and cheer yet as i left i find them here whereat the poet without seeming to reflect that the poor tawny wanderers might probably have been tramping for weeks together through road and lane over moor and mountain and consequently must have been right glad to rest themselves their children and cattle for one whole day and overlooking the obvious truth that such repose might be quite as necessary for them as a walk of the same continuance was pleasing or healthful for the more fortunate poet expresses his indignation in a series of lines the diction and imagery of which would have been rather above than below the mark had they been applied to the immense empire of china in progressive for thirty centuries the weary sun betook himself to rest then issued vesper from the fulgent west outshining like a visible god the glorious path in which he trod and now ascending after one dark hour and one night's diminution of her power behold the mighty moon this way she looks as if at them but they regard not her o oh, better wrong and strife better vain deeds or evil than such life the silent heavens have goings on the stars have tasks but these have none the last instance of this defect for i know no other than these already cited is from the ode page three hundred and fifty one volume two where speaking of a child a six years darling of a pygmy size he thus addresses him thou best philosopher who yet does keep thy heritage thou eye among the blind that deaf and silent reads the eternal deep haunted for ever by the eternal mind mighty prophet seer blessed on whom those truths do rest which we are toiling all our lives to find thou over whom thy immortality broods like the day a master or a slave a present which is not to be put by now here not to stop at the daring spirit of metaphor which connects the epithets deaf and silent with the apostrophized eye or if we are to refer it to the preceding word philosopher the faulty and equivocal syntax of the passage and without examining the propriety of making a master brood or a slave or the day brood at all we will merely ask what does all this mean in what sense is a child of that age a philosopher in what sense does he read the eternal deep in what sense is he declared to be for ever haunted by the supreme being or so inspired as to deserve the splendid titles of a mighty prophet a blessed seer by reflection by knowledge by conscious intuition or by any form or modification of consciousness these would be tidings indeed but such as would presuppose an immediate revelation to the inspired communicator and require miracles to authenticate his inspiration children at this age give us no such information of themselves and at what time were we dipped in the lethe which has produced such utter oblivion of a state so godlike there are many of us that still possess some remembrances more or less distinct respecting themselves at six years old pity that the worthless straws only should float while treasures compared with which all the mines of golconda and mexico were but straws should be absorbed by some unknown gulf into some unknown abyss but if this be too wild and exorbitant to be suspected as having been the poet's meaning if these mysterious gifts faculties and operations are not accompanied with consciousness who else is conscious of them or how can it be called the child if it be no part of the child's conscious being for what i know the thinking spirit within me may be substantially one with the principle of life and of vital operation for what i know it might be employed as a secondary agent in the marvellous organization and organic movements of my body but surely it would be strange language to say that i construct my heart or that i propel the finer influences through my nerves or that i compress my brain and draw the curtains of sleep round my own eyes spinoza and bayman were on different systems both pantheists and among the ancients there were philosophers teachers of the en kai pan who not only taught that god was all but that this all constituted god yet not even these would confound the part as a part with the whole as the whole nay in no system is the distinction between the individual and god between the modification and the one only substance more sharply drawn than in that of spinoza jacobi indeed relates of blessing that after a conversation with him at the house of the poet gleim the tetes and anacreon of the german parnassus 
in which conversation lessing had avowed privately to jacobi his reluctance to admit any personal existence of the supreme being or the possibility of personality except in a finite intellect and while they were sitting at table a shower of rain came on unexpectedly glime expressed his regret at the circumstance because they had meant to drink their wine in the garden upon which lessing in one of his half earnest half joking moods nodded to jacobi and said it is i perhaps that am doing that i e reigning and jacobi answered or perhaps i glime contented himself with staring at them both without asking for any explanation so with regard to this passage in what sense can the magnificent attributes above quoted be appropriated to a child which would not make them equally suitable to a bee or a dog or a field of corn or even to a ship or the wind and waves that propel it the omnipresent spirit works equally in them as in the child and the child is equally unconscious of it as they it cannot surely be that the four lines immediately following are to contain the explanation to whom the grave is but a lonely bed without the sense or sight of day or the warm light a place of thought where we in waiting lie surely it cannot be that this wonder rousing apostrophe is but a comment on the little poem we are seven that the whole meaning of the passage is reducible to the assertion that a child who by the by at six years old would have been better instructed in most christian families has no other notion of death than that of lying in a dark cold place and still i hope not as in a place of thought not the frightful notion of lying awake in his grave the analogy between death and sleep is too simple too natural to render so horrid a belief possible for children even had they not been in the habit as all christian children are of hearing the latter term used to express the former but if the child's belief be only that he is not dead but sleepeth wherein does it differ from that of his father and mother or any other adult and instructed person to form an idea of a thing's becoming nothing or if nothing becoming a thing it is impossible to all finite beings alike of whatever age and however educated or uneducated thus it is with splendid paradoxes in general if the words are taken in the common sense they convey an absurdity and if in contempt of dictionaries and custom they are so interpreted as to avoid the absurdity the meaning dwindles into some bold truism thus you must at once understand the words contrary to their common import in order to arrive at any sense and according to their common import if you are to receive from them any feeling of sublimity or admiration though the instances of this defect in mr wordsworth's poems are so few that for themselves it would have been scarcely just to attract the reader's attention toward them yet i have dwelt on it and perhaps the more for this very reason for being so very few they cannot sensibly detract from the reputation of an author who is even characterized by the number of profound truths in his writings which will stand the severest analysis and yet few as they are they are exactly those passages which his blind admirers would be most likely and best able to imitate but wordsworth where he is indeed wordsworth may be mimicked by copyists he may be plundered by plagiarists but he cannot be imitated except by those who are not born to be imitators for without his depth of feeling and his imaginative power his sense would want its vital warmth and peculiarity and without his strong sense his mysticism would become sickly mere fog and dimness to these defects which as appears by the extracts are only occasional i may oppose with far less fear of encountering the descent of any candid and intelligent reader the following for the most part correspondent excellences first an austere purity of language both grammatically and logically in short a perfect appropriateness of the words to the meaning of how high value i deem this and how particularly estimable i hold the example at the present day has been already stated and in part too the reasons on which i ground both the moral and intellectual importance of habituating ourselves to a strict accuracy of expression it is noticeable how limited an acquaintance with the masterpieces of art will suffice to form a correct and even a sensitive taste where none but masterpieces have been seen and admired while on the other hand the most correct notions and the widest acquaintance with the words of excellence of all ages and countries will not perfectly secure us against the contagious familiarity with the far more numerous offspring of tastelessness or of a perverted taste if this be the case as it notoriously is with the arts of music and painting much more difficult will it be to avoid the infection of multiplied and daily examples in the practice of an art which uses words and words only as its instruments in poetry in which every line every phrase may pass the ordeal of deliberation and deliberate choice it is possible and barely possible to attain that ultimatum which i have ventured to propose as the infallible test of a blameless style namely its untranslatableness in words of the same language without injury to the meaning be it observed however that i include in the meaning of a word not only its correspondent object but likewise all the associations which it recalls for language is framed to convey not the object alone but likewise the character mood and intentions of the person who is representing it 
In poetry it is practicable to preserve the diction uncorrupted by the affectations and misappropriations which promiscuous authorship, and reading not promiscuous only because it is disproportionally most conversant with the compositions of the day, have rendered general. Yet even to the poet, composing in his own province, it is an arduous work, and as the result and pledge of a watchful good sense of fine and numinous distinction, and of complete self-possession, may justly claim all the honour which belongs to an attainment equally difficult and valuable, and the more valuable for being rare. It is at all times the proper food of the understanding, but in an age of corrupt eloquence it is both food and antidote. In prose I doubt whether it be even possible to preserve our style wholly unalloyed by the vicious phraseology which meets us everywhere, from the sermon to the newspaper, from the harangue of the legislator to the speech from the convivial chair, announcing a toast or sentiment. Our chains rattle, even while we are complaining of them. The poems of Boetius rise high in our estimation when we compare them with those of his contemporaries, as Sidonius Apollinaris and others. They might even be referred to a purer age, but that the prose in which they are set, as jewels in a crown of lead or iron, betrays the true age of the writer. Much, however, may be effected by education. I believe not only from grounds of reason, but from having in great measure assured myself of the fact, by actual though limited experience, that, to a youth led from his first boyhood to investigate the meaning of every word and the reason of its choice and position, logic presents itself as an old acquaintance under new names. On some future occasion, more especially demanding such disquisition, I shall attempt to prove the close connection between veracity and habits of mental accuracy, the beneficial after-effects of verbal precision in the preclusion of fanaticism, which masters the feelings more especially by indistinct watchwords, and to display the advantages which language alone, at least which language with incomparably greater ease and certainty than any other means, presents to the instructor, of impressing modes of intellectual energy so constantly, so imperceptibly, and as it were by such elements and atoms, as to secure in due time the formation of a second nature. When we reflect that the cultivation of the judgment is a positive command of the moral law, since the reason can give the principle alone, and the conscience bears witness only to the motive, while the application and effects must depend on the judgment, when we consider that the greater part of our success and comfort in life depends on distinguishing the similar from the same, that which is peculiar in each thing from that which it has in common with others, so as still to select the most probable, instead of the merely possible or positively unfit, we shall learn to value earnestly and with a practical seriousness a mean already prepared for us by nature and society, of teaching the young mind to think well and wisely, by the same unremembered process and with the same never-forgotten results, as those by which it is taught to speak and converse. Now how much warmer the interest is, how much more genial the feelings of reality and practicability, and thence how much stronger the impulses to imitation are, which a contemporary writer, and especially a contemporary poet, excites in youth and commencing manhood, has been treated of in the earlier pages of these sketches. I have only to add that all the praise which is due to the exertion of such influence for a purpose so important, joined with that which must be claimed for the infrequency of the same excellence in the same perfection, belongs in full right to Mr. Wordsworth. I am far, however, from denying that we have poets whose general style possesses the same excellence as Mr. Moore, Lord Byron, Mr. Bowles, and, in all his later and more important works, our laurel honouring laureate. But there are none in whose works I do not appear to myself to find more exceptions than in those of Wordsworth. Quotations or specimens would here be wholly out of place, and must be left for the critic who doubts and would invalidate the justice of this eulogy so applied. The second characteristic excellence of Mr. Wordsworth's work is, a correspondent weight and sanity of the thoughts and sentiments, one not from books, but from the poet's own meditative observation. They are fresh and have the dew upon them. His muse, at least when in her strength of wing, and when she hovers aloft in her proper element, makes audible a linked lay of truth, of truth profound a sweet continuous lay, not learnt but native, her own natural notes. Even throughout his smaller poems, there is scarcely one which is not rendered valuable by some just and original reflection, ch. 25, volume 2, or the two following passages in one of his humblest compositions. O reader, had you in your mind such stores a silent thought can bring, O gentle reader, you would find a tale in everything, and I've heard of hearts unkind, kind deeds with coldness still returning, alas, the gratitude of men has oftener left me mourning or in a still higher strain the six beautiful quatrains page one hundred and thirty four thus fares it still in our decay and yet the wiser mind mourns less for what age takes away than what it leaves behind the blackbird in the summer trees the lark upon the hill let loose their carols when they please are quiet when they will with nature never do they wage a foolish strife they see 
a happy youth in their old age is beautiful and free but we are pressed by heavy laws and often glad no more we wear a face of joy because we have been glad of yore if there is one who need bemoan his kindred laid in earth the household hearts that were his own it is the man of mirth my days my friend are almost gone my life has been approved and many love me but by none am i enough beloved or the sonnet on bonaparte page two hundred and two volume two or finally for a volume would scarce suffice to exhaust the instances the last stanza of the poem on the withered celandine volume two page three hundred and twelve to be a prodigal's favourite then worse truth a miser's pensioner behold our lot o man that from thy fair and shining youth age might but take the things youth needed not both in respect of this and of the former excellence mr wordsworth strikingly resembles samuel daniel one of the golden writers of our golden elizabethan age now most causelessly neglected samuel daniel whose diction bears no mark of time no distinction of age which has been and as long as our language shall last will be so far the language of the to-day and for ever as that it is more intelligible to us than the transitory fashions of our own particular age a similar praise is due to his sentiments no frequency of perusal can deprive them of their freshness for though they are brought into the full daylight of every reader's comprehension yet are they drawn up from depths which few in any age are privileged to visit into which few in any age have courage or inclination to descend if mr wordsworth is not equally with daniel alike intelligible to all readers of average understanding in all passages of his works the comparative difficulty does not arise from the greater impurity of the ore but from the nature and uses of the metal a poem is not necessarily obscure because it does not aim to be popular it is enough if a work be perspicuous to those for whom it is written and fit audience find though few to the ode on the intimations of immortality from recollections of early childhood the poet might have prefixed the lines which dante addresses to one of his own canzoni canzone i credo che saranno radi color che tua ragione intendan bene tanto lo sei faticoso ed alto o lyric song there will be few i think who may thy import understand aright thou art for them so arduous and so high but the ode was intended for such readers only as had been accustomed to watch the flux and reflux of their inmost nature to venture at times into the twilight realms of consciousness and to feel a deep interest in modes of inmost being to which they know that the attributes of time and space are inapplicable and alien but which yet cannot be conveyed save in symbols of time and space for such readers the sense is sufficiently plain and they will be as little disposed to charge mr wordsworth with believing the platonic pre-existence in the ordinary interpretation of the words as i am to believe that plato himself ever meant or taught it pola oi ut ancunos nocea bellae and don enti pharetras fonanta sintoisin es deto pan hermaenon chatisei sophos o pola edos fua mathontes de labroi panglossia coraces os acranta gareton dios pros on nicha theon third and wherein he soars far above daniel the sinewy strength and originality of single lines and paragraphs the frequent curiosa felicitas of his diction of which i need not here give specimens having anticipated them in a preceding page this beauty and as eminently characteristic of wordsworth's poetry his rudest assailants have felt themselves compelled to acknowledge and admire fourth the perfect truth of nature in his images and descriptions as taken immediately from nature and proving a long and genial intimacy with the very spirit which gives the physiognomic expression to all the works of nature like a green field reflected in a calm and perfectly transparent lake the image is distinguished from the reality only by its greater softness and lustre like the moisture or the polish on a pebble genius neither distorts nor false colours its objects but on the contrary brings out many a vein and many a tint which escape the eye of common observation thus raising to the rank of gems what had been often kicked away by the hurrying foot of the traveller on the dusty high road of custom let me refer to the whole description of skating volume one page forty two to forty seven especially to the lines so through the darkness and the cold we flew and not a voice was idle with the din meanwhile the precipices rang aloud the leafless trees in every icy crag tinkled like iron while the distant hills into the tumult sent an alien sound of melancholy not unnoticed while the stars eastward were sparkling clear and in the west the orange sky of evening died away or to the poem on the green linnet volume one page two hundred and forty four what can be more accurate yet more lovely than the two concluding stanzas upon yon tuft of hazel trees that twinkle to the gusty breeze behold him perched in ecstasies yet seeming still to hover there where the flutter of his wings 
upon his back and body flings shadows and sunny glimmerings that cover him all over while thus before my eyes he gleams a brother of the leaves he seems when in a moment forth he teems his little song in gushes as if it pleased him to disdain and mock the form which he did feign while he was dancing with the train of leaves among the bushes or the description of the blue cap and of the noontide silence page two hundred and eighty four or the poem to the cuckoo page two hundred and ninety nine or lastly though i might multiply the references to ten times the number to the poem so completely wordsworth's commencing three years she grew in sun and shower fifth a meditative pathos a union of deep and subtle thought with sensibility a sympathy with man as man the sympathy indeed of a contemplator rather than a fellow sufferer or co-mate spectator out particeps but of a contemplator from whose view no difference of rank conceals the sameness of the nature no injuries of wind or weather or toil or even of ignorance wholly disguise the human face divine the superscription and the image of the creator still remain legible to him under the dark lines with which guilt or calamity had cancelled or cross-barred it here the man and the poet lose and find themselves in each other the one as glorified the latter as substantiated in this mild and philosophic pathos wordsworth appears to me without a compeer such as he is so he writes see volume one page one hundred and thirty four to one hundred and thirty six or that most affecting composition the affliction of margaret of page one hundred and sixty five to one hundred and sixty eight which no mother and if i may judge by my own experience no parent can read without a tear or turn to that genuine lyric in the former edition entitled the mad mother page one hundred and seventy four to one hundred and seventy eight of which i cannot refrain from quoting two of the stanzas both of them for their pathos and the former for the fine transition in the two concluding lines of the stanza so expressive of that deranged state in which from the increased sensibility the sufferer's attention is abruptly drawn off by every trifle and in the same instant plucked back again by the one despotic thought bringing home with it by the blending fusing power of imagination and passion the alien object to which it had been so abruptly diverted no longer an alien but an ally and an inmate suck little babe oh suck again it cools my blood it cools my brain thy lips i feel them baby they draw from my heart the pain away oh press me with thy little hand it loosens something at my chest about that tight and deadly band i feel thy little fingers pressed the breeze i see is in the tree it comes to cool my babe and me thy father cares not for my breast tis thine sweet baby there to rest tis all thine own and if its hue be change that was so fair to view tis fair enough for thee my dove my beauty little child is flown but thou wilt live with me in love and what if my poor cheek be brown tis well for me thou canst not see how pale and wan it else would be last and preeminently i challenge for this poet the gift of imagination in the highest and strictest sense of the word in the play of fancy wordsworth to my feelings is not always graceful and sometimes recondite the likeness is occasionally too strange or demands too peculiar a point of view or is such as appears the creature of predetermined research rather than spontaneous presentation indeed his fancy seldom displays itself as mere and unmodified fancy but in imaginative power he stands nearest of all modern writers to shakespeare and milton and yet in a kind perfectly unborrowed and his own to employ his own words which are at once an instance and an illustration he does indeed to all thoughts and to all objects add the gleam the light that never was on sea or land the consecration and the poet's dream i shall select a few examples as most obviously manifesting this faculty but if i should ever be fortunate enough to render my analysis of imagination its origin and characters thoroughly intelligible to the reader he will scarcely open on a page of this poet's works without recognising more or less the presence and the influences of this faculty from the poem on the yew trees volume one page three hundred and three three hundred and four but worthier still of note are those fraternal four of borrowdale joined in one solemn and capacious grove huge trunks and each particular trunk a growth of intertwisted fibrous serpentine upcoiling and inveterately convolved not uninformed with fantasy and looks that threaten the profane a pillared shade upon whose grassless floor of red-brown hue by sheddings from the pinal umbrage tinged perennially beneath whose sable roof of boughs as if of festal purpose decked with unrejoicing berries ghostly shapes may meet up noontide fear and trembling hope silence and foresight death the skeleton and time the shadow there to celebrate as in a natural temple scattered o'er with altars undisturbed of mossy stone united worship or in mute repose to lie and listen to the mountain flood murmuring from glasomara's inmost caves 
The effect of the old man's figure in the poem of Resolution and Independence, volume 2, page 33. While he was talking thus, the lonely place, the old man's shape and speech all troubled me. In my mind's eye I seemed to see him pace about the weary moors continually, wandering about alone and silently. Or the 8th, 9th, 19th, 26th, 31st, and 33rd, in the collection of miscellaneous sonnets, the sonnet on the subjugation of Switzerland, page 210, or the last ode, from which I especially select, the two following stanzas or paragraphs, page 349 to 350. Our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting, the soul that rises with us, our life's star, hath had elsewhere its setting, and cometh from afar. Not in entire forgetfulness, and not in utter nakedness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come from God, who is our home. Heaven lies about us in our infancy. Shades of the prison-house begin to close upon the growing boy. But he beholds the light, and whence it flows, he sees it in his joy. The youth who daily further from the east must travel, still is nature's priest, and by the vision splendid is on his way attended. At length the man perceives it die away, and fade into the light of common day. And page 352 to 354 of the same ode. O oh joy, that in our embers is something that doth live, that nature yet remembers what was so fugitive. The thought of our past years in me doth breed perpetual benedictions, not indeed for that which is most worthy to be blessed, delight and liberty, the simple creed of childhood, whether busy or at rest, with new-fledged hope still fluttering in his breast. Not for these I raise the song of thanks and praise, but for those obstinate questionings of sense and outward things, fallings from us, vanishings, blank misgivings of a creature, moving about in worlds not realised, high instincts before which our mortal nature did tremble like a guilty thing surprised. But for those first affections, those shadowy recollections, which, be they what they may, are yet the fountain-light of all our day, and yet a master-light of all our seeing, uphold us, cherish, and have power to make our noisy years seem moments in the being of the eternal silence, truth that wake to perish never, which neither listlessness nor mad endeavour, nor man nor boy, nor all that is at enmity with joy, can utterly abolish or destroy. Hence in a season of calm weather, though inland far we be, our souls have sight of that immortal sea which brought us hither, can in a moment travel thither, and see the children sport upon the shore, and hear the mighty waters rolling evermore. And since it would be unfair to conclude with an extract, which though highly characteristic must yet, from the nature of the thoughts and the subject, be interesting or perhaps intelligible to but a limited number of readers, I will add from the poet's last published work, a passage equally Wordsworthian, of the beauty of which, and of the imaginative power displayed therein, there can be but one opinion and one feeling. See White Doe, page 5. Fast the churchyard fills, anon. Look again, and they all are gone. The cluster round the porch, and the folk, who sat in the shade of the prior's oak. And scarcely had they disappeared, ere the prelusive hymn is heard. With one consent the people rejoice, filling the church with a lofty voice. They sing a service which they feel, for tis the sunrise now of zeal, and faith and hope are in their prime, in great Eliza's golden time. A moment ends the fervent din, and all is hushed without and within, for though the priest more tranquilly recites the holy liturgy, the only voice which you can hear is the river murmuring near, when soft the dusky trees between, and down the path through the open green, where is no living thing to be seen, and through yon gateway where is found, beneath the arch with ivy bound, free entrance to the churchyard ground and right across the verdant sod towards the very house of god comes gliding in with lovely gleam comes gliding in serene and slow soft and silent as a dream a solitary doe white she is as lily of june and beauteous as the silver moon when out of sight the clouds are driven and she is left alone in heaven or like a ship some gentle day in sunshine sailing far away a glittering ship that hath the plain of ocean for her own domain what harmonious pensive changes wait upon her as she ranges round and through this pile of state overthrown and desolate now a step or two her way is through space of open day where the enamoured sunny light brightens her that was so bright now doth a delicate shadow fall falls upon her like a breath from some lofty arch or wall as she passes underneath the following analogy will i am apprehensive appear dim and fantastic but in reading Bartram's travels I could not help transcribing the following lines as a sort of allegory or connected simile and metaphor of Wordsworth's intellect and genius. The soil is a deep, rich, dark mould on a deep stratum of tenacious clay, and that on a foundation of rocks which often break through both strata, lifting their backs above the surface. The trees which chiefly grow here are the gigantic black oak, 
magnolia grandiflora, fraximus excelsior, platane, and a few stately tulip trees. What Mr. Wordsworth will produce, it is not for me to prophesy, but I could pronounce with the liveliest convictions what he is capable of producing. It is the first genuine philosophic poem. The preceding criticism will not, I am aware, avail to overcome the prejudices of those who have made it a business to attack and ridicule Mr. Wordsworth's compositions. Truth and prudence might be imagined as concentric circles. The poet may perhaps have passed beyond the latter, but he has confined himself far within the bounds of the former, in designating these critics as too petulant to be passive to a genuine poet, and too feeble to grapple with him, men of palsied imaginations, in whose minds all healthy action is languid, who therefore feed as the many direct them, or with the many are greedy after vicious provocatives. So much for the detractors from Wordsworth's merits. On the other hand, much as I might wish for their fuller sympathy, I dare not flatter myself that the freedom with which I have declared my opinions concerning both his theory and his defects, most of which are more or less connected with his theory, either as cause or effect, will be satisfactory or pleasing to all the poets, admirers, and advocates. More indiscriminate than mine their admiration may be, deeper and more sincere it cannot be. But I have advanced no opinion either for praise or censure, other than as text introductory to the reasons which compel me to form it. Above all, I was fully convinced that such a criticism was not only wanted, but that, if executed with adequate ability, it must conduce in no mean degree to Mr. Wordsworth's reputation. His fame belongs to another age, and can neither be accelerated nor retarded. How small the proportion of the defects are to the beauties, I have repeatedly declared, and that no one of them originates in deficiency of poetic genius. Had they been more and greater, I should still, as a friend to his literary character in the present age, consider an analytic display of them as pure gain, if only it removed, as surely to all reflecting minds, even the foregoing analysis must have removed, the strange mistakes so slightly grounded, yet so widely and industriously propagated, of Mr. Wordsworth's turn for simplicity. I am not half as much irritated by hearing his enemies abuse him for vulgarity of style, subject, and conception, as I am disgusted with the gilded side of the same meaning, as displayed by some affected admirers, with whom he is forsooth a sweet simple poet and so natural that little master charles and his younger sister are so charmed with them that they play at goody blake or at johnny and betty foy were the collection of poems published with these biographical sketches important enough which i am not vain enough to believe to deserve such a distinction even as i have done so would i be done unto for more than eighteen months have the volume of poems entitled sibylline leaves and the present volume up to this page been printed and ready for publication but ere I speak of myself in the tones which are alone natural to me under the circumstances of late years, I would fain present myself to the reader as I was in the first dawn of my literary life, when hope grew round me like the climbing vine, and fruits and foliage not my own seem mine. For this purpose I have selected from the letters which I wrote home from Germany, those which appeared likely to be most interesting, and at the same time most pertinent to the title of this work. End of chapter 22《Letters》Letter 1 of Biographia Literaria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, Biographia Literaria, by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Saturain's Letters. Letter 1. On Sunday morning, September 16, 1798, the Hamburg packet set sail from Yarmouth, and I, for the first time in my life, beheld my native land retiring from me at the moment of its disappearance, in all the kirks, churches, chapels, and meeting-houses, in which the greater number, I hope, of my countrymen were at that time assembled, I will dare question whether there was one more ardent prayer offered up to heaven than that which I then preferred for my country. Now then, said I to a gentleman who was standing near me, we are out of our country. Not yet, not yet, he replied, and pointed to the sea. This too is a Britain's country. This bon mot gave a fillip to my spirits, I rose and looked round on my fellow passengers, who were all on the deck. We were eighteen in number, vide Lisette, five Englishmen, an English lady, a French gentleman and his servant, an Hanoverian and his servant, a Prussian, a Swede, two Danes, and a mulatto boy, a German tailor and his wife, the smallest couple I ever beheld, and a Jew. We were all on the deck, but in a short time I observed marks of dismay. The lady retired to the cabin in some confusion and many of the faces round me assumed a very doleful and frog-coloured appearance, and within an hour the number of those on deck was lessened by one-half. I was giddy, but not sick, and the giddiness soon went away, 
but left a feverishness and want of appetite which i attributed in great measure to the cyber mephitis of the bilge-water and it was certainly not decreased by the exportations from the cabin however i was well enough to join the able-bodied passengers one of whom observed not inaptly that momus might have discovered an easier way to see a man's inside than by placing a window in his breast he needed only have taken a salt-water trip in a packet-boat i am inclined to believe that a packet is far superior to a stage-coach as a means of making men open out to each other in the latter the uniformity of posture disposes to dozing and the definitiveness of the period at which the company will separate makes each individual think more of those to whom he is going than of those with whom he is going but at sea more curiosity is excited if only on this account that the pleasant or unpleasant qualities of your companions are of great importance to you from the uncertainty how long you may be obliged to house with them besides if you are countrymen that now begins to form a distinction and a bond of brotherhood and if of different countries there are new incitements of conversation more to ask and more to communicate i found that i had interested the danes in no common degree i had crept into the boat on the deck and fallen asleep but was awakened by one of them about three o'clock in the afternoon who told me that they had been seeking me in every hole and corner and insisted that i should join their party and drink with them he talked english with such fluency as left me wholly unable to account for the singular and even ludicrous incorrectness with which he spoke it i went and found some excellent wines and a dessert of grapes with a pineapple the danes had christened me doctor theology and dressed as i was all in black with large shoes and black worsted stockings i might certainly have passed very well for a methodist missionary however i disclaimed my title what then may you be a man of fortune no a merchant no a merchant's traveller no a clerk no and philosophe perhaps it was at that time in my life in which of all possible names and characters i had the greatest disgust to that of un philosophe but i was weary of being questioned and rather than be nothing or at best only the abstract idea of a man i submitted by a bow even to the aspersion implied in the word un philosophe the dane then informed me that all in the present party were philosophers likewise certes we were not of the stoic school for we drank and talked and sung till we talked and sung all together and then we rose and danced on the deck a set of dancers which in one sense of the word at least were very intelligibly and appropriately entitled reels the passengers who lay in the cabin below in all the agonies of sea-sickness must have found our bacchanalian merriment a tune harsh and of dissonant mood from their complaint i thought so at the time and by way i suppose of supporting my newly assumed philosophical character i thought too how closely the greater number of our virtues are connected with the fear of death and how little sympathy we bestow on pain where there is no danger the two danes were brothers the one was a man with a clear white complexion white hair and white eyebrows looked silly and nothing that he uttered gave the lie to his looks the other whom by way of eminence i have called the dane had likewise white hair but was much shorter than his brother with slender limbs and a very thin face slightly pock fretten this man convinced me of the justice of an old remark that many a faithful portrait in our novels and farces has been rashly censured for an outrageous caricature or perhaps nonentity i had retired to my station in the boat he came and seated himself by my side and appeared not a little tipsy he commenced the conversation in the most magnific style and as a sort of pioneering to his own vanity he flattered me with such grossness the parasites of the old comedy were modest in the comparison his language and accentuation were so exceedingly singular that i determined for once in my life to take notes of a conversation here it follows somewhat abridged indeed but in all other respects as accurately as my memory permitted the dane what imagination what language what vast science and what eyes what a milk-white forehead oh my heaven why you're a got answer you do me too much honour sir the dane oh me if you should think i is flattering you no 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 i have ten thousand a year yes ten thousand a year yes ten thousand pound a year well and what is that a mere trifle i wouldn't give my sincere heart for ten times the money yes you're a got i a mere man but my dear friend think of me as a man is is i mean to ask you now my dear friend is i not very eloquent is i not speak english very fine answer most admirably believe me sir i have seldom heard even a native talk so fluently the dane squeezing my hand with great vehemence my dear friend what an affection and fidelity we have for each other but tell me do tell me 
Is I not now and then speak some fault? Is I not in some wrong? Answer, why, sir, perhaps it might be observed by nice critics in the English language that you occasionally use the word is instead of am. In our best companies we generally say I am and not I is or eyes. Excuse me, sir, it is a mere trifle. The day. Oh, is, is, am, 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 yes, yes, I know, I know. Answer. I am, thou art, he is, we are, ye are, they are. The Dane. Yes, yes, I know, I know. Am, am, am is the presence, and is, is the perfectum. Yes, yes, and are is the plusquam perfectum. Answer. And art, sir, is? The Dane. My dear friend, it is the plusquam perfectum. No, no, that is a great lie. R is the plusquam perfectum, and art is the plusquam plu perfectum. Then swinging my hand to and fro, and cocking his little bright hazel eyes at me, that danced with vanity and wine. You see, my dear friend, that I too have some learning. Answer. Learning, sir, who dare suspect it? Who can listen to you for a minute? Who can even look at you? Without perceiving the extent of it. The Dane. My dear friend. Then with a would-be humble look and in a tone of voice as if he was reasoning i could not talk so of prawns and imperfectum and futurum and plusquam plu perfectum and all that my dear friend without some learning answer sir a man like you cannot talk on any subject without discovering the depth of his information the dane the grammatic greek my friend ha 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 laughing and swinging my hand to and fro then with a sudden transition to great solemnity now i will tell you my dear friend there did happen about me but the whole historia of Denmark record no instance about nobody else. The bishop did ask me all the questions about all the religion in the Latin grammar. Answer. The grammar, sir. The language, I presume. The Dane, a little offended. Grammar is language, and language is grammar. Answer. Ten thousand pardons. The Dane. Well, and I was only fourteen years answer only fourteen years old the dane no more i was fourteen years old and he asked me all questions religion and philosophy and all in the latin language and i answered him all every one my dear friend all in the latin language answer a prodigy an absolute prodigy the dane no 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 he was a bishop a great superintendent answer yes a bishop the dane a bishop not a mere predicant not a prediger answer my dear sir we have misunderstood each other i said that your answering in latin at so early an age was a prodigy that is a thing that is wonderful that does not often happen the dane often there is not one instance recorded in the whole historia of denmark answer and since then sir the dane i was sent over to the west indies to our island and there i had no more to do vid books no no i put my genius another way and i have made ten thousand pound a year is not dat genius my dear friend but vat is money i think the poorest man alive my equal yes my dear friend my little fortune is pleasant to my generous heart because i can do good no man with so little a fortune ever did so much generosity no person no man person no woman person ever denies it but we are all god's children here the hanoverian interrupted him and the other dane the swede and the prussian joined us together with a young englishman who spoke the german fluently and interpreted to me many of the prussian's jokes the prussian was a travelling merchant turned of three score a hale man tall strong and stout full of stories gesticulations and buffoonery with the soul as well as the look of a mountebank who while he is making you laugh picks your pocket amid all his droll looks and droll gestures there remained one look untouched by laughter and that one look was the true face the others were but its mask the hanoverian was a pale fat bloated young man whose father had made a large fortune in london as an army contractor he seemed to emulate the manners of young englishmen of fortune he was a good-natured fellow not without information or literature but a most egregious coxcomb he had been in the habit of attending the house of commons and had once spoken as he informed me with great applause in a debating society for this he appeared to have qualified himself with laudable industry 
for he was perfect in Walker's pronouncing dictionary, and with an accent which forcibly reminded me of the Scotchman in Roderick Random, who professed to teach the English pronunciation, he was constantly deferring to my superior judgment whether or no I had pronounced this or that word with propriety, or the true delicacy. When he spoke, though it were only half a dozen sentences, he always rose, for which I could detect no other motive than his partiality to that elegant phrase so liberally introduced in the orations of our British legislators, while I am on my legs. The Swede, whom for reasons that will soon appear I shall distinguish by the name of nobility, was a strong-featured, scurvy-faced man, his complexion resembling in colour a red-hot poker beginning to cool. He appeared miserably dependent on the Dane, but was, however, incomparably the best informed and most rational of the party. Indeed, his manners and conversation discovered him to be both a man of the world and a gentleman. The Jew was in the hold. The French gentleman was lying on the deck so ill that I could observe nothing concerning him, except the affectionate attentions of his servant to him. The poor fellow was very sick himself, and every now and then ran to the side of the vessel, still keeping his eye on his master, but returned in a moment and seated himself again by him, now supporting his head, now wiping his forehead, and talking to him all the while in the most soothing tones. There had been a matrimonial squabble of a very ludicrous kind in the cabin, between the little German tailor and his little wife. He had secured two beds, one for himself and one for her. This had struck the little woman as a very cruel action. She insisted upon their having but one, and assured the mate in the most piteous tones that she was his lawful wife. The mate and the cabin boy decided in her favour, abused the little man for his want of tenderness with much humour, and hoisted him into the same compartment with his sea-sick wife. This quarrel was interesting to me, as it procured me a bed which I otherwise should not have had. In the evening, at seven o'clock, the sea rolled higher, and the Dane, by means of the greater agitation, eliminated enough of what he had been swallowing to make room for a great deal more. His favourite potation was sugar and brandy, i.e., a very little warm water with a large quantity of brandy, sugar, and nutmeg. His servant boy, a black-eyed mulatto, had a good-natured round face, exactly the colour of the skin of the walnut colonel. The Dane and I were again seated tete-a-tete -tete in the ship's boat. The conversation, which was now indeed rather an oration than a dialogue, became extravagant beyond all that I ever heard. He told me that he had made a large fortune in the island of Santa Cruz, and was now returning to Denmark to enjoy it. He expatiated on the style in which he meant to live, and the great undertakings which he proposed to himself to commence, till the brandy aiding his vanity, and his vanity and garrulity aiding the brandy. He talked like a madman, and treated me to accompany him to Denmark. There I should see his influence with the government, and he would introduce me to the king, etc., etc. Thus he went on, dreaming aloud, and then, passing with a very lyrical transition to the subject of general politics, he declaimed, like a member of the corresponding society, about, not concerning, the rights of man, and assured me that, notwithstanding his fortune, he thought the poorest man alive his equal. All are equal, my dear friend, all are equal, we are all God's children. The poorest man hath the same rights with me. Jack, Jack, some more sugar and brandy. There is that fellow now. He is a mulatto, but he is my equal. That's right, Jack, taking the sugar and brandy. Here, you, sir, shake hands with this gentleman. Shake hands with me, you dog. Dare, dare. We are all equal, my dear friend. Do I not speak like Socrates and Plato and Cato? They were all philosophers, my dear philosoph, all very great men, and so was Homer and Virgil, but they were poets. Yes, yes, I know all about it. But what can anybody say more than this? We are all equal, all God's children. I have ten thousand a year, but I am no more than the meanest man alive. I have no pride, and yet, my dear friend, I can say do, and it is done. Ha, 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 my dear friend. Now there is that gentleman pointing to nobility. He is a Swedish baron. You shall see. Ho! Oh, calling to the Swede. Get me, will you, a bottle of wine from the cabin? Swede. Here, Jack, go and get your master a bottle of wine from the cabin. Dane. No, 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 do you go now. You go yourself. You go now. Swede. Pah! Dane. Now go, go, I pray you. And the Swede went. After this, the Dane commenced an harangue on religion and mistaking me for unphilosoph in the continental sense of the word, he talked of deity in a declamatory style, very much resembling the devotional rants of that rude blunderer Mr. Thomas Paine in his age of reason, and whispered in my ear what damned hypocrisy all Jesus Christ's business was. I dare aver that few men have less reason to charge themselves with indulging in persiflage than myself. I should hate it if it were only that it is a Frenchman's vice, and feel a pride in avoiding it, 
because our own language is too honest to have a word to express it by. But in this instance the temptation had been too powerful, and I have placed it on the list of my offences. Pericles answered one of his dearest friends, who had solicited him on a case of life and death, to take an equivocal oath for his preservation. Debeo amicis opitulari sed usque ad deos. Friendship herself must place her last and boldest step on this side the altar. What Pericles would not do to save a friend's life, you may be assured, I would not hazard merely to mill the chocolate-pot of a drunken fool's vanity, till it frothed over. Assuming a serious look, I profess myself a believer, and sunk at once an hundred fathoms in his good graces. He retired to his cabin, and I wrapped myself up in my greatcoat and looked at the water. A beautiful white cloud of foam at momently intervals coursed by the side of the vessel with a roar, and little stars of flame danced and sparkled and went out in it, and every now and then light detachments of this white cloud-like foam darted off from the vessel's side, each with its own small constellation, over the sea, and scoured out of sight, like a Tartar troop over a wilderness. It was cold, the cabin was at open war with my olfactories, and I found reason to rejoice in my greatcoat, a weighty, high-caped, respectable rug, the collar of which turned over and played the part of a nightcap very possibly, in looking up at two or three bright stars which oscillated with the motion of the sails. I fell asleep, but was awakened at one o'clock, Monday morning, by a shower of rain. I found myself compelled to go down into the cabin, where I slept very soundly, and awoke with a very good appetite at breakfast-time, my nostrils, the most placable of all the senses, reconciled to, or indeed insensible, of the mephitis. Monday, September 17th, I had a long conversation with the Swede, who spoke with the most poignant contempt of the Dane, whom he described as a fool, purse-mad but he confirmed the boast of the Dane respecting the largeness of his fortune, which he had acquired in the first instance as an advocate, and afterwards as a planter. From the Dane and from himself I collected that he was indeed a Swedish nobleman, who had squandered a fortune that was never very large, and had made over his property to the Dane, on whom he was now utterly dependent. He seemed to suffer very little pain from the Dane's insolence. He was in a high degree humane and attentive to the English lady, who suffered most fearfully, and for whom he performed many little offices, with a tenderness and delicacy which seemed to prove real goodness of heart. Indeed, his general manners and conversation were not only pleasing, but even interesting, and I struggled to believe his insensibility respecting the Dane, philosophical fortitude. For though the Dane was now quite sober, his character oozed out of him at every pore, and after dinner, when he was again flushed with wine, every quarter of an hour, perhaps oftener, he would shout out to the Swede, "'Ho, oh, nobility, go, do such a thing, Mr. Nobility!' tell the gentleman such a story, and so forth, with an insolence which must have excited disgust and detestation, if his vulgar rants on the sacred rights of equality, joined to his wild havoc of general grammar, no less than of the English language, had not rendered it so irresistibly laughable. At four o'clock I observed a wild duck swimming on the waves, a single solitary wild duck. It is not easy to conceive how interesting a thing it looked in that round, objectless desert of waters. I had associated such a feeling of immensity with the ocean, that I felt exceedingly disappointed, when I was out of sight of all land, at the narrowness and nearness, as it were, of the circle of the horizon. So little are images capable of satisfying the obscure feelings connected with words. In the evening the sails were lowered, lest we should run foul of the land, which can be seen only at a small distance, and at four o'clock on Tuesday morning I was awakened by the cry of land, land. It was an ugly island rock at a distance on our left, called Heligoland, well known to many passengers from Yarmouth to Hamburg, who have been obliged by stormy weather to pass weeks and weeks in weary captivity on it, stripped of all their money by the exorbitant demands of the wretches who inhabit it. So at least the sailors inform me. About nine o'clock we saw the mainland, which seemed scarcely able to hold its head above water, low, flat, and dreary, with lighthouses and landmarks, which seemed to give a character and language to the dreariness. We entered the mouth of the Elbe, passing Neuwerk, though as yet the right bank only of the river was visible to us. On this I saw a church, and thanked God for my safe voyage, not without affectionate thoughts of those I had left in England. At eleven o'clock on the same morning we arrived at Cuxhaven. The ship dropped anchor, and the boat was hoisted out, to carry the Hanoverian and a few others on shore. The captain agreed to take us who remained to Hamburg for ten guineas, to which the Dane contributed so largely that the other passengers paid but half a guinea each. Accordingly we hauled anchor and passed gently up the river. At Cuxhaven both sides of the river may be seen in clear weather. We could now see the right bank only. We passed a multitude of English traders that had been waiting many weeks for a wind. In a short time both banks became visible, 
both flat and evidencing the labour of human hands by their extreme neatness on the left bank i saw a church or two in the distance on the right bank we passed by steeple and windmill and cottage and windmill and single house windmill and windmill and neat single house and steeple these were the objects and in the succession the shores were very green and planted with trees not inelegantly thirty-five miles from cuxhaven the night came on us and as the navigation of the elbow is perilous we dropped anchor over what place thought i does the moon hang to your eye my dearest friend to me it hung over the left bank of the elbow close above the moon was a huge volume of deep black cloud while a very thin fillet crossed the middle of the orb as narrow and thin and black as a ribbon of crape the long trembling road of moonlight which lay on the water and reached to the stern of our vessel glimmered dimly and obscurely we saw two or three lights from the right bank probably from bedrooms i felt the striking contrast between the silence of this majestic stream whose banks are populous with men and women and children and flocks and herds between the silence by night of this peopled river and the ceaseless noise and uproar and loud agitations of the desolate solitude of the ocean the passengers below had all retired to their beds and i felt the interest of this quiet scene the more deeply from the circumstance of having just quitted them for the prussian had during the whole of the evening displayed all his talents to captivate the dane who had admitted him into the train of his dependents the young englishman continued to interpret the prussian's jokes to me they were all without exception profane and abominable but some sufficiently witty and a few instants which he related in his own person were valuable as illustrating the manners of the countries in which they had taken place five o'clock on wednesday morning we hauled the anchor but were soon obliged to drop it again in consequence of the thick fog which our captain feared would continue the whole day but about nine it cleared off and we sailed slowly along close by the shore of a very beautiful island forty miles from cuxhaven the wind continuing slack this holm or island is about a mile and a half in length wedge-shaped well wooded with glades of the liveliest green and rendered more interesting by the remarkably neat farmhouse on it it seemed made for retirement without solitude a place that would allure one's friends while it precluded the impertinent calls of mere visitors the shores of the elba now became more beautiful with rich meadows and trees running like a low wall along the river's edge and peering over them neat houses and especially on the right bank a profusion of steeple spires white black or red an instinctive taste teaches men to build their churches in flat countries with spire steeples which as they cannot be referred to any other object point as with silent finger to the sky and stars and sometimes when they reflect the brazen light of a rich though rainy sunset appear like a pyramid of flame burning heavenward i remember once and once only to have seen a spire in a narrow valley of a mountainous country the effect was not only mean but ludicrous and reminded me against my will of an extinguisher the close neighbourhood of the high mountain at the foot of which it stood had so completely dwarfed it and deprived it of all connection with the sky or clouds forty-six english miles from cuxhaven and sixteen from hamburg the danish village veda ornaments the left bank with its black steeple and close by it is the wild and pastoral hamlet of Schulau. hitherto both the right and left bank green to the very brink and level with the river resemble the shores of a park canal the trees and houses were alike low sometimes the low trees overtopping the yet lower houses sometimes the low houses rising above the yet lower trees but at Schulau, the left bank rises at once forty or fifty feet and stares on the river with its perpendicular facade of sand thinly patched with tufts of green the elbow continued to present a more and more lively spectacle from the multitude of fishing-boats and the flocks of seagulls wheeling round them the clamorous rivals and companions of the fishermen till we came to blancaness a most interesting village scattered amid scattered trees over three hills in three divisions each of the three hills stares upon the river with faces of bare sand with which the boats with their bare poles standing in files along the banks made a sort of fantastic harmony between each facade lies a green and woody dell each deeper than the other in short it is a large village made up of individual cottages each cottage in the centre of its own little wood or orchard and each with its own separate path a village with a labyrinth of paths or rather a neighbourhood of houses it is inhabited by fishermen and boat-makers the blankanese boats being in great request through the whole navigation of the elbow here first we saw the spires of hamburg and from hence as far as altona the left bank of the elbow is uncommonly pleasing considered as the vicinity of an industrious and republican city in that style of beauty or rather prettiness that might tempt the citizen into the country and yet gratify the taste which he had acquired in the town 
Summer houses and Chinese show work are everywhere scattered along the high and green banks. The boards of the farmhouses left unplastered and gaily painted with green and yellow. And scarcely a tree not cut into shapes and made to remind the human being of his own power and intelligence instead of the wisdom of nature. Still, however, these are links of connection between town and country, and far better than the affectation of tastes and enjoyments for which men's habits have disqualified them. Passing by on Saturdays and Sundays with the burghers of Hamburg smoking their pipes, the women and children feasting in the alcoves of box and yew, and it becomes a nature of its own. On Wednesday four o'clock we left the vessel, and passing with trouble through the huge masses of shipping that seemed to choke the wide elbow from Altona upward, we were at length landed at the Boom House, Hamburg. End of letter one. Saturain's Letters, Letter Two, of Biographia Literaria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Saturain's Letters, Letter Two. To a Lady, Ratzeburg. Meine liebe Freundin. See how natural the German comes for me, though I have not yet been six weeks in the country almost as fluently as English from my neighbour, the Amtschreiber, or public secretary, who, as often as we meet, though it should be half a dozen times in the same day, never fails to greet me with, Damn your plut und eyes, my dearest Englander, wie goes it? Which is certainly a proof of great generosity on his part, these words being his whole stock of English. I had, however, a better reason than the desire of displaying my proficiency, for I wish to put you in good humour with a language from the acquirement of which I have promised myself much edification and the means, too, of communicating a new pleasure to you and your sister during our winter readings. And how can I do this better than by pointing out its gallant attention to the ladies? Our English affix s is, I believe, confined either to words derived from the Latin as actress, directress, etc., or from the French as mistress, duchess, and the like. But the German in enables us to designate the sex in every possible relation of life. Thus the Amtmann's lady is the Frau Amtmannin, the secretary's wife. By the by, the handsomest woman I have yet seen in Germany is the allerliebste Frau Amtschreiberin, the colonel's lady, die Frau Obristin or Connellerin, and even the parson's wife, die Frau Pastorin. But I am especially pleased with their Freundin, which, unlike the Amica of the Romans, is seldom used but in its best and purest sense. Now I know it will be said that a friend is already something more than a friend, when a man feels an anxiety to express to himself that this friend is a female, but this I deny, in that sense at least in which the objection will be made. I would hazard the impeachment of heresy, rather than abandon my belief that there is a sex in our souls, as well as in their perishable garments, and he who does not feel it never truly loved a sister, nay, is not capable even of loving a wife, as she deserves to be loved, if she indeed be worthy of that holy name. Now, I know, my gentle friend, what you are murmuring to yourself. This is so like him, running away after the first bubble that chance has blown off from the surface of his fancy, when one is anxious to learn where he is and what he has seen. Well, then, that I am settled at Ratzeburg, with my motives and the particulars of my journey hither, will inform you. My first letter to him, with which doubtless he has edified your whole fireside, left me safely landed at Hamburg, on the Elbe stairs, at the Boom House. While standing on the stairs, I was amused by the contents of the passage-boat, which crosses the river once or twice a day from Hamburg to Harburg. It was stowed close with all people of all nations, in all sorts of dresses, and the men all with pipes in their mouths, and these pipes of all shapes and fancies, straight and wreathed, simple and complex, long and short, cane, clay, porcelain, wood, tin, silver, and ivory, most of them with silver chains and silver bowl covers. Pipes and boots are the first universal characteristic of the male hamburgers that would strike the eye of a raw traveller. But I forget my promise of journalising as much as possible. Therefore, September 19th afternoon, my companion, who, you recollect, speaks the French language with unusual propriety, had formed a kind of confidential acquaintance with the emigrant, who appeared to be a man of sense, and whose manners were those of a perfect gentleman. He seemed about fifty or rather more. Whatever is unpleasant in French manners from excess in the degree, had been softened down by age or affliction, and all that is delightful in the kind, alacrity and delicacy in little attentions, etc., remained, and without bustle, gesticulation, or disproportionate eagerness. His demeanour exhibited the minute philanthropy of a polished Frenchman, tempered by the sobriety of the English character, disunited from its reserve. There is something strangely attractive in the character of a gentleman when you apply the word emphatically, and yet in that sense of the term which it is more easy to feel than to define. 
it neither includes the possession of high moral excellence nor of necessity even the ornamental graces of manner i have now in my mind's eye a person whose life would scarcely stand scrutiny even in the court of honour much less in that of conscience and his manners if nicely observed would of the two excite an idea of awkwardness rather than of elegance and yet every one who conversed with him felt and acknowledged the gentleman the secret of the matter i believe to be this we feel the gentlemanly character present to us whenever under all the circumstances of social intercourse the trivial not less than the important through the whole detail of his manners and deportment and with the ease of a habit a person shows respect to others in such a way as at the same time implies in his own feelings an habitual and assured anticipation of reciprocal respect from them to himself in short the gentlemanly character arises out of the feeling of equality acting as a habit yet flexible to the varieties of rank and modified without being disturbed or superseded by them this description will perhaps explain to you the ground of one of your own remarks as i was englishing to you the interesting dialogue concerning the causes of the corruption of eloquence what perfect gentlemen these old romans must have been i was impressed i remember with the same feeling at the time i was reading a translation of cicero's philosophical dialogues and of his epistolary correspondence while in pliny's letters i seemed to have a different feeling he gave me the notion of a very fine gentleman you uttered the words as if you had felt that the adjunct had injured the substance and the increased degree altered the kind pliny was the courtier of an absolute monarch cicero an aristocratic republican for this reason the character of gentleman in the sense to which i have confined it is frequent in england rare in france and found where it is found in age or the latest period of manhood while in germany the character is almost unknown but the proper antipathy of a gentleman is to be sought for among the anglo-american democrats i owe this digression as an act of justice to this amiable frenchman and of humiliation for myself for in a little controversy between us on the subject of french poetry he made me feel my own ill behaviour by the silent reproof of contrast and when i afterwards apologised to him for the warmth of my language he answered me with a cheerful expression of surprise and an immediate compliment which a gentleman might both make with dignity and receive with pleasure i was pleased therefore to find it agreed on that we should if possible take up our quarters in the same house my friend went with him in search of an hotel and i to deliver my letters of recommendation i walked onward at a brisk pace enlivened not so much by anything i actually saw as by the confused sense that i was for the first time in my life on the continent of our planet i seemed to myself like a liberated bird that had been hatched in an aviary who now after his first soar of freedom poises himself in the upper air very naturally i began to wonder at all things some for being so like and some for being so unlike the things in england dutch women with large umbrella hats shooting out half a yard before them with a prodigal plumpness of petticoat behind the women of hamburg with caps plaited on the call with silver or gold or both bordered round with stiffened lace which stood out before their eyes but not lower so that the eyes sparkled through it the hanoverian with the fore part of the head bare then a stiff lace standing up like a wall perpendicular on the cap and the cap behind tailed with an enormous quantity of ribbon which lies or tosses on the back their visnomies seemed like a goodly banner spread in defiance of all enemies the ladies all in english dresses all rouged and all with bad teeth which you notice instantly from their contrast to the almost animal too glossy mother-of-pearl whiteness and the regularity of the teeth of the laughing loud-talking countrywomen and servant girls who with their clean white stockings and with slippers without heel quarters tripped along the dirty streets as if they were secured by a charm from the dirt with a lightness too which surprised me who had always considered it as one of the annoyances of sleeping in an inn that i had to clatter up stairs in a pair of them the streets narrow to my english nose sufficiently offensive and explaining at first sight the universal use of boots without any appropriate path for the foot passengers the gable ends of the houses all towards the street some in the ordinary triangular form and entire as the botanists say but the greater number notched and scalloped with more than chinese grotesqueness above all i was struck with the profusion of windows so large and so many that the houses look all glass mr pitt's window tax with its pretty little additionals sprouting out from it like young toadlets on the back of a surinam toad would certainly improve the appearance of the hamburg houses which have a slight summer look not in keeping with their size incongruous with the climate and precluding that feeling of retirement and self-content which one wishes to associate with a house in a noisy city but a conflagration would i fear be the previous requisite to the production of any architectural beauty in hamburg for verily it is a filthy town i moved on and crossed a multitude of ugly bridges with huge black deformities of water-wheels close by them 
the water intersects the city everywhere and would have furnished to the genius of italy the capabilities of all that is most beautiful and magnificent in architecture it might have been the rival of venice and it is huddle and ugliness stench and stagnation the jungfer stieg that is young ladies walk to which my letters directed me made an exception it was a walk or promenade planted with treble rows of elm trees which being yearly pruned and cropped remained slim and dwarf-like this walk occupies one side of a square piece of water with many swans on it perfectly tame and moving among the swans shoey pleasure-boats with ladies in them rowed by their husbands or lovers some paragraphs have been here omitted thus embarrassed by sad and solemn politeness still more than by broken english it sounded like the voice of an old friend when i heard the emigrant servant inquiring after me he had come for the purpose of guiding me to our hotel through streets and streets i pressed on as happy as a child and i doubt not with a childish expression of wonderment in my busy eyes amused by the wicker wagons with movable benches across them one behind the other these were the hackney coaches amused by the signboards of the shops on which all the articles sold within are painted and that too very exactly though in a grotesque confusion a useful substitute for language in this great mart of nations amused with the incessant tinkling of the shop and house-door bells the bell hanging over each door and struck with a small iron rod at every entrance and exit and finally amused by looking in at the windows as i passed along the ladies and gentlemen drinking coffee or playing cards and the gentlemen all smoking i wished myself a painter that i might have sent you a sketch of one of the card parties the long pipe of one gentleman rested on the table its bowl half a yard from his mouth fuming like a censer by the fish-pool the other gentleman who was dealing the cards and of course had both hands employed held his pipe in his teeth which hanging down between his knees smoked beside his ankles hogarth himself never drew a more ludicrous distortion both of attitude and physiognomy than this effort occasioned nor was there wanting beside it one of those beautiful female faces which the same hogarth in whom the satirist never extinguished that love of beauty which belonged to him as a poet so often and so gladly introduces as the central figure in a crowd of humorous deformities which figures such is the power of true genius neither acts nor is meant to act as a contrast but diffuses through all and over each of the group a spirit of reconciliation and human kindness and even when the attention is no longer consciously directed to the cause of this feeling still blends its tenderness with our laughter and thus prevents the instructive merriment at the whims of nature or the foibles or humours of our fellow-men from degenerating into the heart poison of contempt or hatred our hotel die wildermann the sign of which was no bad likeness of the landlord who had engrafted on a very grim face a restless grin that was at every man's service and which indeed like an actor rehearsing to himself he kept playing in expectation of an occasion for it neither our hotel i say nor its landlord were of the genteelest class but it has one great advantage for a stranger by being in the market-place and the next neighbour of the huge church of st nicholas a church with shops and houses built up against it out of which wens and warts its high massy steeple rises necklace near the top with a round of large gilt balls a better pole-star could scarcely be desired long shall i retain the impression made on my mind by the awful echo so loud and long and tremulous of the deep-toned clock within this church which awoke me at two in the morning from a distressful dream occasioned i believe by the feather-bed which is used here instead of bedclothes i will rather carry my blanket about with me like a wild indian than submit to this abominable custom our emigrant acquaintance was we found an intimate friend of the celebrated abbe de lille and from the large fortune which he possessed under the monarchy had rescued sufficient not only for independence but for respectability he had offended some of his fellow emigrants in london whom he had obliged with considerable sums by a refusal to make further advances and in consequence of their intrigues had received an order to quit the kingdom i thought it one proof of his innocence that he attached no blame either to the alien act or to the minister who had exerted it against him and a still greater that he spoke of london with rapture and of his favourite niece who had married and settled in england with all the fervour and all the pride of a fond parent a man sent by force out of a country obliged to sell out of the stocks at a great loss and exiled from those pleasures and that style of society which habit had rendered essential to his happiness whose predominant feelings were yet all of a private nature resentment for friendship outraged and anguish for domestic affections interrupted such a man i think i could dare warrant guiltless of espionage in any service most of all in that of the present french directory he spoke with ecstasy of paris under the monarchy and yet the particular facts which made up his description left as deep a conviction on my mind of french worthlessness as his own tale had done of emigrant ingratitude 
Since my arrival in Germany, I have not met a single person, even among those who abhor the revolution, that spoke with favour or even charity of the French emigrants, though the belief of their influence in the organisation of this disastrous war, from the horrors of which North Germany deems itself only reprieved, not secured, may have some share in the general aversion with which they are regarded. Yet I am deeply persuaded that the far greater part is owing to their own profligacy, to their treachery and hard-heartedness to each other, and the domestic misery or corrupt principles, which so many of them have carried into the families of their protectors. My heart dilated with honest pride, as I recall to mind the stern yet amiable characters of the English patriots, who sought refuge on the continent at the Restoration. Oh, let not our civil war under the first Charles be paralleled with the French Revolution. In the former, the character overflowed from excess of principle, in the latter from the fermentation of the dregs. The former was a civil war between the virtues and virtuous prejudices of the two parties, the latter between the vices. The Venetian glass of the French monarchy shivered and flew asunder with the working of a double poison. September 20th. I was introduced to Mr. Klopstock, the brother of the poet, who again introduced me to Professor Eberling, an intelligent and lively man, though deaf. So deaf, indeed, that it was a painful effort to talk with him, as we were obliged to drop our pearls into a huge ear-trumpet. From this courteous and kind-hearted man of letters, I hope the German literati in general may resemble this first specimen, I heard a tolerable Italian pun and an interesting anecdote. When Bonaparte was in Italy, having been irritated by some instance of perfidy, he said in a loud and vehement tone in a public company, "'Tis a true proverb, gli italiani tutti la durani, and that is, the Italians all plunderers. A lady had the courage to reply, non tutti ma buona parte not all but a good part or bonaparte this i confess sounded to my ears as one of the many good things that might have been said the anecdote is more valuable for it instances the ways and means of french insinuation hoche had received much information concerning the face of the country from a map of unusual fullness and accuracy the maker of which he heard resided at dusseldorf at the storming of dusseldorf by the french army Hosh previously ordered that the house and property of this man should be preserved, and entrusted the performance of the order to an officer on whose troop he could rely. Finding afterwards that the man had escaped before the storming commenced, Hosh exclaimed, He had no reason to flee. It is for such men, not against them, that the French nation makes war, and consents to shed the blood of its children. You remember Milton's sonnet. The great Emathian conqueror bid spare the house of Pindarus when temple and tower went to the ground. Now, though the Dusseldorf map-maker may stand in the same relation to the Theban bard as the snail that marks its path by lines of film on the wall it creeps over, to the eagle that soars sunward and beats the tempest with its wings, it does not therefore follow that the Jacobin of France may not be as valiant a general and as good a politician as the madman of Macedon. From Professor Eberling's, Mr. Klopstock accompanied my friend and me to his own house, where I saw a fine bust of his brother. There was a solemn and heavy greatness in his countenance, which corresponded to my preconceptions of his style and genius. I saw there likewise a very fine portrait of Lessing, whose works are at present the chief object of my admiration. His eyes were uncommonly like mine, if anything, rather larger and more prominent. But the lower part of his face and his nose, oh, what an exquisite expression of elegance and sensibility! There appeared no depth, weight, or comprehensiveness in the forehead. The whole face seemed to say that Lessing was a man of quick and voluptuous feelings, of an active but light fancy, acute, yet acute not in the observation of actual life, but in the arrangements and management of the ideal world, that is, in taste and in metaphysics. I assure you that I wrote these very words in my memorandum book with the portrait before my eyes, and when I knew nothing of Lessing but his name, and that he was a German writer of eminence. We consumed two hours and more over a bad dinner at the Tab Dot, patience at a german ordinary smiling at time the germans are the worst cooks in europe there is place for every two persons a bottle of common wine rhenish and claret alternately but in the houses of the opulent during the many and long intervals of the dinner the servants hand round glasses of richer wines at the lord of culpin's they came in this order burgundy madeira port frontiniac pacchiaretti old hock mountain champagne hock again bishop and lastly punch a tolerable quantum methinks the last dish at the ornery, viz. slices of roast pork, for all the larger dishes are brought in, cut up, and first handed round, and then set on the table, with stewed prunes and other sweet fruits, and this followed by cheese and butter with plates of apples, reminded me of Shakespeare, and Shakespeare put it in my head to go to the French comedy. Bless me! Why, it is worse than our modern English plays! The first act informed me that a court-martial is to be held on account Vatron, 
who had drawn his sword on the colonel his brother-in-law the officers plead in his behalf in vain his wife the colonel's sister pleads with most tempestuous agonies in vain she falls into hysterics and faints away to the dropping of the inner curtain in the second act sentence of death is passed on the count his wife as frantic and hysterical as before more so good industrious creature as she could not be the third and last act the wife still frantic very frantic indeed the soldiers just about to fire the handkerchief actually dropped when reprieve reprieve is heard from behind the scenes and in comes prince somebody pardons the count and the wife is still frantic only with joy that was all oh dear lady this is one of the cases in which laughter is followed by melancholy for such is the kind of drama which is now substituted everywhere for shakespeare and racine you well know that i offer violence to my own feelings in joining these names but however meanly i may think of the french serious drama even in its most perfect specimens and with whatever right i may complain of its perpetual falsification of the language and of the connections and transitions of thought which nature has appropriated to states of passion still however the french tragedies are consistent works of art and the offspring of great intellectual power preserving a fitness in the parts and a harmony in the whole they form a nature of their own though a false nature still they excite the minds of the spectators to active thought to a striving after ideal excellence the soul is not stupefied into mere sensations by worthless sympathy with our own ordinary sufferings or an empty curiosity for the surprising undignified by the language or the situations which awe and delight the imagination what i would ask of the crowd that press forward to the pantomimic tragedies and weeping comedies of kotzebue and his imitators what are you seeking is it comedy but in the comedy of shakespeare and moliere the more accurate my knowledge and the more profoundly i think the greater is the satisfaction that mingles with my laughter for though the qualities which these writers portray are ludicrous indeed either from the kind or the excess and exquisitely ludicrous yet are they the natural growth of the human mind and such as with more or less change in the drapery i can apply to my own heart or at least to whole classes of my fellow-creatures how often are not the moralist and the metaphysician obliged for the happiest illustrations of general truths and the subordinate laws of human thought and action to quotations not only from the tragic characters but equally from the jakes falstaff and even from the fools and clowns of shakespeare or from the miser hypochondriast and hypocrite of moliere say not that i am recommending abstractions for these class characteristics which constitute the instructiveness of a character are so modified and particularized in each person of the shakespearean drama that life itself does not excite more distinctly that sense of individuality which belongs to real existence paradoxical as it may sound one of the essential properties of geometry is not less essential to dramatic excellence and if i may mention his name without pedantry to a lady aristotle has accordingly required of the poet an involution of the universal in the individual the chief differences are that in geometry it is the universal truth itself which is uppermost in the consciousness in poetry the individual form in which the truth is clothed with the ancients and not less with the elder dramatists of england and france both comedy and tragedy were considered as kinds of poetry they neither sought in comedy to make us laugh merely much less to make us laugh by wry faces accidents of jargon slang phrases for the day or the clothing of commonplace morals in metaphors drawn from the shops or mechanic occupations of their characters nor did they condescend in tragedy to wheedle away the applause of the spectators by representing before them facsimiles of their own mean selves in all their existing meanness or to work on their sluggish sympathies by a pathos not a whit more respectable than the maudlin tears of drunkenness their tragic scenes were meant to affect us indeed but within the bounds of pleasure and in union with the activity both of our understanding and imagination they wished to transport the mind to a sense of its possible greatness and to implant the germs of that greatness during the temporary oblivion of the worthless thing we are and of the peculiar state in which each man happens to be suspending our individual recollections and lulling them to sleep amid the music of nobler thought hold methinks i hear the spokesman of the crowd reply and we will listen to him i am the plaintiff and he the defendant defendant hold are not our modern sentimental plays filled with the best christian morality plaintive yes just as much of it and just that part of it which you can exercise without a single christian virtue without a single sacrifice that is really painful to you just as much as flatters you sends you away pleased with your own hearts and quite reconciled to your vices which can never be thought very ill of when they keep such good company and walk hand in hand with so much compassion and generosity adulation so loathsome that you would spit in the man's face who dared offer it to you in a private company unless you interpreted it as insulting irony you appropriate with infinite satisfaction 
when you share the garbage with a whole sty and gobble it out of a common trough no caesar must pace your boards no antony no royal dane no orestes no andromache d no or as few of them as possible what has a plain citizen of london or hamburg to do with your kings and queens and your old schoolboy pagan heroes besides everybody knows the stories and what curiosity can we feel p what sir not for the manner not for the delightful language of the poet not for the situations the action and reaction of the passions d you are hasty sir the only curiosity we feel is in the story and how can we be anxious concerning the end of a play or be surprised by it when we know how it will turn out p your pardon for having interrupted you we now understand each other you seek then in a tragedy which wise men of old held for the highest effort of human genius the same gratification as that you receive from a new novel the last german romance and other dainties of the day which can be enjoyed but once if you carry these feelings to the sister art of painting michelangelo's sistine chapel and the scripture gallery of raphael can expect no favour from you you know all about them beforehand and are doubtless more familiar with the subjects of those paintings than with the tragic tales of the historic or heroic ages there is a consistency therefore in your preference of contemporary writers for the great men of former times those at least who were deemed great by our ancestors sought so little to gratify this kind of curiosity that they seem to have regarded the story in a not much higher light than the painter regards his canvas as that on not by which they were to display their appropriate excellence no work resembling a tale or romance can well show less variety of invention in the incidents or less anxiety in weaving them together than the don quixote of cervantes its admirers feel the disposition to go back and reperuse some preceding chapter at least ten times for once that they find any eagerness to hurry forwards or open the book on those parts which they best recollect even as we visit those friends oftenest whom we loved most and with whose characters and actions we are the most intimately acquainted in the divine ariosto as his countrymen call this their darling poet i question whether there be a single tale of his own invention or the elements of which were not familiar to the readers of old romance i will pass by the ancient greeks who thought it even necessary to the fable of a tragedy and that its substance should be previously known that there had been at least fifty tragedies with the same title would be one of the motives which determined sophocles and euripides in the choice of electra as a subject but milton d ay milton indeed but do not dr johnson and other great men tell us that nobody now reads milton but as a task p so much the worse for them of whom this can be truly said but why then do you pretend to admire shakespeare the greater part if not all of his dramas were as far as the names and the main instance are concerned already stock plays all the stories at least on which they are built pre-existed in the chronicles ballads or translations of contemporary or preceding english writers why i repeat do you pretend to admire shakespeare is it perhaps that you only pretend to admire him however as one for all you have dismissed the well-known events and personages of history or the epic muse what have you taken in their stead whom has your tragic muse armed with her bowl and dagger the sentimental muse i should have said whom you have seated in the throne of tragedy what heroes has she reared on her buskins d oh our good friends and next-door neighbours honest tradesmen valiant tars high-spirited half-pay officers philanthropic jews virtuous courtesans tender-hearted braziers and sentimental rat-catchers a little bluff or so but all our very generous tender-hearted characters are a little rude or misanthropic and all our misanthropes very tender-hearted p but i pray you friend in what actions great or interesting can such men be engaged d they give away a great deal of money find rich dowries for young men and maidens who have all other good qualities they browbeat lords baronets and justices of the peace for they are as bold as hector they rescue stage-coaches at the instant they are falling down precipices carry away infants in the sight of opposing armies and some of our performers act a muscular able-bodied man to such perfection that our dramatic poets who always have the actors in their eye seldom fail to make their favourite male character as strong as samson and then they take such prodigious leaps and what is done on the stage is more striking even than what is acted i once remember such a deafening explosion that i could not hear a word of the play for half an act after it and a little real gunpowder being set fire to at the same time and smelt by all the spectators the naturalness of the scene was quite astonishing p but how can you connect with such men and such actions that dependence of thousands on the fate of one which gives so lofty an interest to the personages of shakespeare and the greek tragedians how can you connect with them that sublimest of all feelings the power of destiny and the controlling might of heaven which seems to elevate the characters which sink beneath its irresistible blow d oh mere fancies 
we seek and find on the present stage our own wants and passions our own vexations losses and embarrassments p it is your own poor petty fogging nature then which you desire to have represented before you not human nature in its height and vigour but surely you might find the former with all its joys and sorrows more conveniently in your own houses and parishes d true but here comes a difference fortune is blind but the poet has his eyes open and is besides as complaisant as fortune is capricious he makes everything turn out exactly as we would wish it he gratifies us by representing those as hateful or contemptible whom we hate and wish to despise p aside that is he gratifies your envy by libelling your superiors d he makes all those precise moralists who affect to be better than their neighbours turn out at last abject hypocrites traitors and hard-hearted villains and your men of spirit who take their girl in their glass with equal freedom prove the true men of honour and that no part of the audience may remain unsatisfied reform in the last scene and leave no doubt in the minds of the ladies that they will make most faithful and excellent husbands though it does seem a pity that they should be obliged to get rid of qualities which had made them so interesting besides the poor become rich all at once and in the final matrimonial choice the opulent and high-born themselves are made to confess that virtue is the only true nobility and that a lovely woman is a dowry of herself p excellent but you have forgotten those brilliant flashes of loyalty those patriotic praises of the king and old england which especially if conveyed in a metaphor from the ship or the shop so often solicit and so unfailingly receive the public plaudit i give your prudence credit for the omission for the whole system of your drama is a moral and intellectual jacobinism of the most dangerous kind and those commonplace rants of loyalty are no better than hypocrisy in your playwrights and your own sympathy with them a gross self-delusion for the whole secret of dramatic popularity consists with you in the confusion and subversion of the natural order of things their causes and their effects in the excitement of surprise by representing the qualities of liberality refined feeling and a nice sense of honour those things rather which pass among you for such in persons and in classes of life where experience teaches us least to expect them and in rewarding with all the sympathies that are the dues of virtue those criminals whom law reason and religion have excommunicated from our esteem and now good-night truly i might have written this last sheet without having gone to germany but i fancied myself talking to you by your own fireside and can you think it a small pleasure to me to forget now and then that i am not there besides you and my other good friends have made up your minds to me as i am and from whatever place i write you will expect that part of my travels will consist of excursions in my own mind end of saturnine's letters letter two saturnine's letters letter three of biographia literaria this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Saturday's Letters, Letter 3. Ratzeburg. No little fish thrown back again into the water, no fly unimprisoned from a child's hand, could more buoyantly enjoy its element than I this clean and peaceful house with this lovely view of the town groves and lake of ratzeburg from the window at which i am writing my spirit certainly and my health i fancied were beginning to sink under the noise dirt and unwholesome air of our hamburg hotel i left it on sunday september twenty third with a letter of introduction from the poet klopstock to the amtmann of ratzeburg the amtmann received me with kindness and introduced me to the worthy pastor who agreed to board and lodge me for any length of time not less than a month the vehicle in which i took my place was considerably larger than an english stage-coach to which it bore much the same proportion and rude resemblance that an elephant's ear does to the human its top was composed of naked boards of different colours and seeming to have been parts of different wainscots instead of windows there were leathern curtains with a little eye of glass in each they perfectly answered the purpose of keeping out the prospect and letting in the cold i could observe little therefore but the inns and farmhouses at which we stopped they were all alike except in size one great room like a barn with a hayloft over it the straw and hay dangling in tufts through the boards which form the ceiling of the room and the floor of the loft from this room which is paved like a street sometimes one sometimes two smaller ones are enclosed at one end these are commonly floored in the large room the cattle pigs poultry men women and children live in amicable community yet there was an appearance of cleanliness and rustic comfort one of these houses i measured it was an hundred feet in length and the apartments were taken off from one corner between these and the stalls there was a small interspace 
and here the breadth was forty-eight feet, but thirty-two where the stalls were. Of course the stalls were on each side eight feet in depth. The faces of the cows, etc., were turned towards the room, indeed they were in it, so that they had at least the comfort of seeing each other's faces. Stall-feeding is universal in this part of Germany, a practice concerning which the agriculturist and the poet are likely to entertain opposite opinions, or at least to have very different feelings. The woodwork of these buildings on the outside is left unplastered, as in old houses among us, and being painted red and green, it cuts and tessellates the buildings very gaily. From within three miles of Hamburg almost to Moln, which is thirty miles from it, the country, as far as I could see it, was a dead flat, only varied by woods. At Moln it became more beautiful. I observed a small lake nearly surrounded with groves, and a palace in view belonging to the King of Great Britain, and inhabited by the inspector of the forests. We were nearly the same time in travelling the thirty-five miles from Hamburg to Ratzeburg, as we had been in going from London to Yarmouth, one hundred and twenty-six miles. The lake of Ratzeburg runs from south to north, about nine miles in length, and varying in breadth from three miles to half a mile. About a mile from the southernmost point, it is divided into two, of course, very unequal parts by an island, which, being connected by a bridge and a narrow slip of land with the one shore, and by another bridge of immense length with the other shore, forms a complete isthmus. On this island, the town of Ratzeburg is built. The pastor's house of vicarage, together with the Amtmann's Amtschreibers and the church, stands near the summit of a hill, which slopes down to the slip of land and the little bridge, from which, through a superb military gate, you step into the island town of Ratzeburg. This again is itself a little hill, by ascending and descending which you arrive at the long bridge, and so to the other shore. The water to the south of the town is called the Little Lake, which, however, almost engrosses the beauties of the whole, the shores being just often enough green and bare to give the proper effect to the magnificent groves which occupy the greater part of their circumference from the turnings windings and indentations of the shore the views vary almost every ten steps and the whole has a sort of majestic beauty a feminine grandeur at the north of the great lake and peeping over it i see the seven church towers of lubeck at the distance of twelve or thirteen miles yet as distinctly as if they were not three the only defect in the view is that ratzeburg is built entirely of red bricks and all the houses roofed with red tiles to the eye therefore it presents a clump of brick dust red yet this evening october tenth twenty minutes past five i saw the town perfectly beautiful and the whole softened down into complete keeping if i may borrow a term from the painters the sky over ratzeburg and all the east was a pure evening blue while over the west it was covered with light sandy clouds hence a deep red light spread over the whole prospect in undisturbed harmony with the red town the brown red woods and the yellow red reeds on the skirts of the lake two or three boats with single persons paddling them floated up and down in the rich light which not only was itself in harmony with all but brought all into harmony i should have told you that i went back to hamburg on thursday september twenty seventh to take leave of my friend who travelled southward and returned hither on the monday following from Empfelder, a village half-way from Ratzeburg, I walked to Hamburg through deep sandy roads and a dreary flat, the soil everywhere white, hungry, and excessively pulverised. But the approach to the city is pleasing. Light, cool country houses, which you can look through and see the gardens behind them, with arbours and trellis-work and thick vegetable walls, and trees and cloisters and piazzas, each house with neat rails before it and green seats within the rails. Every object, whether the growth of nature or the work of man, was neat and artificial. It pleased me far better than if the houses and gardens and pleasure-fields had been in a nobler taste, for this nobler taste would have been mere apery. The busy, anxious, money-loving merchant of Hamburg could only have adopted. He could not have enjoyed the simplicity of nature. The mind begins to love nature by imitating human conveniences in nature, but this is a step in intellect, though a low one, and were it not so, yet all around me spoke of innocent enjoyment and sensitive comforts, and I entered with unscrupulous sympathy into the enjoyments and comforts even of the busy, anxious, money-loving merchants of Hamburg. In this charitable and Catholic mood I reached the vast ramparts of the city. These are huge green cushions, one rising above the other, with trees growing in the interspaces, pledges and symbols of a long peace. Of my return I have nothing worth communicating, except that I took extra post, which answers to posting in England. These North German post chases are uncovered wicker carts. An English dust cart is a piece of finery, a chef d'oeuvre of mechanism compared with them and the horses. A savage might use their ribs instead of his fingers for a numeration table. Wherever we stopped, the postilion fed his cattle with the brown rye bread of which he eat himself, all breakfasting together. Only the horses had no gin to their water and the postilion no water to his gin. 
now and henceforward for subjects of more interest to you and to the objects in search of which i left you namely the literati and literature of germany believe me i walked with an impression of awe on my spirits as w and myself accompanied mr klopstock to the house of his brother the poet which stands about a quarter of a mile from the city gate it is one of a row of little commonplace summer houses for so they looked with four or five rows of young meagre elm trees before the windows beyond which is a green and then a dead flat intersected with several roads whatever beauty thought i may be before the poet's eyes at present it must certainly be purely of his own creation we waited a few minutes in a neat little parlour ornamented with the figures of two of the muses and with prints the subjects of which were from klopstock's odes the poet entered i was much disappointed in his countenance and recognised in it no likeness to the bust there was no comprehension in the forehead no weight over the eyebrows no expression of peculiarity moral or intellectual on the eyes no massiveness in the general countenance he is if anything rather below the middle size he wore very large half-boots which his legs filled so fearfully were they swollen however though neither w nor myself could discover any indications of sublimity or enthusiasm in his physiognomy we were both equally impressed with his liveliness and his kind and ready courtesy he talked in french with my friend and with difficulty spoke a few sentences to me in english his enunciation was not in the least affected by the entire want of his upper teeth the conversation began on his part by the expression of his rapture at the surrender of the detachment of french troops under general humbert their proceedings in ireland with regard to the committee which they had appointed with the rest of their organizing system seemed to have given the poet great entertainment he then declared his sanguine belief in nelson's victory and anticipated its confirmation with a keen and triumphant pleasure his words tones looks implied the most vehement anti-gallicanism the subject changed to literature and i inquired in latin concerning the history of german poetry and the elder german poets to my great astonishment he confessed that he knew very little on the subject he had indeed occasionally read one or two of their elder writers but not so as to enable him to speak of their merits professor eberling he said would probably give me every information of this kind the subject had not particularly excited his curiosity he then talked of milton and glover and thought glover's blank verse superior to milton's w and myself expressed our surprise and my friend gave his definition and notion of harmonious verse that it consisted the english iambic blank verse above all in the apt arrangement of pauses and cadences and the sweep of whole paragraphs with many a winding bout of link sweetness long drawn out and not in the even flow much less in the prominence of antithetic vigour of single lines which were indeed injurious to the total effect except where they were introduced for some specific purpose klopstock assented and said that he meant to confine glover's superiority to single lines he told us that he had read milton in a prose translation when he was fourteen i understood him thus myself and w interpreted klopstock's french as i had already construed it he appeared to know very little of milton or indeed of our poets in general he spoke with great indignation of the english prose translation of his messiah all the translations had been bad very bad but the english was no translation there were pages on pages not in the original and half the original was not to be found in the translation w told him that i intended to translate a few of his odes as specimens of german lyrics he then said to me in english i wish you would render into english some select passages of the messiah and revenge me of your countrymen it was the liveliest thing which he produced in the whole conversation he told us that his first ode was fifty years older than his last i looked at him with much emotion i considered him as the venerable father of german poetry as a good man as a christian seventy-four years old with legs enormously swollen yet active lively cheerful and kind and communicative my eyes felt as if a tear was swelling into them in the portrait of lessing there was a toupee periwig which enormously injured the effect of his physiognomy klopstock wore the same powdered and frizzled by the by old men ought never to wear powder the contrast between a large snow-white wig and the colour of an old man's skin is disgusting and wrinkles in such a neighbourhood appear only channels for dirt it is an honour to poets and great men that you think of them as parts of nature and anything of trick and fashion wounds you in them as much as when you see venerable ewes clipped into miserable peacocks the author of the messiah should have worn his own grey hair his powder and periwig were to the eye what mr virgil would be to the ear Klopstock dwelt much on the superior power which the german language possessed of concentrating meaning he said he had often translated parts of homer and virgil line by line and a german line proved always sufficient for a greek or latin one in english you cannot do this i answered that in english we could commonly render one greek heroic line in a line and a half of our common heroic metre and i conjectured that this line and a half would be found to contain no more syllables than one german or greek hexameter 
he did not understand me and i who wished to hear his opinions not to correct them was glad that he did not we now took our leave at the beginning of the french revolution klopstock wrote odes of congratulation he received some honorary presents from the french republic a golden crown i believe and like our priestly was invited to a seat in the legislature which he declined but when french liberty metamorphosed herself into a fury he sent back these presents with a palinodia declaring his abhorrence of their proceedings and since then he has been perhaps more than enough an anti-gallican i mean that in his just contempt and detestation of the crimes and follies of the revolutionists he suffers himself to forget that the revolution itself is a process of the divine providence and that as the folly of men is the wisdom of god so are their iniquities instruments of his goodness from klopstock's house we walked to the ramparts discoursing together on the poet and his conversation till our attention was diverted to the beauty and singularity of the sunset and its effects on the objects around us there were woods in the distance a rich sandy light nay of a much deeper colour than sandy lay over these woods that blackened in the blaze over that part of the woods which lay immediately under the intenser light a brassy mist floated the trees on the ramparts and the people moving to and fro between them were cut or divided into equal segments of deep shade and brassy light had the trees and the bodies of the men and women been divided into equal segments by a rule or pair of compasses the portions could not have been more regular all else was obscure it was a fairy scene and to increase its romantic character among the moving objects thus divided into alternate shade and brightness was a beautiful child dressed with the elegant simplicity of an english child riding on a stately goat the saddle bridle and other accoutrements of which were in a high degree costly and splendid before i quit the subject of hamburg let me say that i remained a day or two longer than i otherwise should have done in order to be present at the feast of st michael the patron saint of hamburg expecting to see the civic pomp of this commercial republic i was however disappointed there were no processions two or three sermons were preached to two or three old women in two or three churches and st michael and his patronage wished elsewhere by the higher classes all places of entertainment theatre etc being shut up on this day in hamburg there seems to be no religion at all in lubeck it is confined to the women the men seem determined to be divorced from their wives in the other world if they cannot in this you will not easily conceive a more singular sight than is presented by the vast aisle of the principal church at lubeck seen from the organ loft for being filled with female servants and persons in the same class of life and all their caps having gold and silver calls it appears like a rich pavement of gold and silver i will conclude this letter with the mere transcription of notes which my friend w made of his conversations with klopstock during the interviews that took place after my departure on these i shall make but one remark at present and that will appear a presumptuous one namely that klopstock's remarks on the venerable sage of konigsberg are to my own knowledge injurious and mistaken and so far is it from being true that his system is now given up that throughout the universities of germany there is not a single professor who is not either a kantian or a disciple of fichte whose system is built on the kantian and presupposes its truth or lastly who though an antagonist of kant as to his theoretical work has not embraced wholly or in part his moral system and adopted part of his nomenclature klopstock having wished to see the calvary of cumberland and asked what was thought of it in england i went to remnants the english bookseller where i procured the analytical review in which is contained the review of cumberland's calvary i remember to have read there some specimens of a blank verse translation of the messiah i had mentioned this to klopstock and he had a great desire to see them i walked over to his house and put the book into his hands on adverting to his own poem he told me he began the messiah when he was seventeen he devoted three entire years to the plan without composing a single line he was greatly at a loss in what manner to execute his work there were no successful specimens of versification in the german language before this time the first three cantos he wrote in a species of measured or numerous prose this though done with much labour and some success was far from satisfying him he had composed hexameters both latin and greek as a school exercise and there had been also in the german language attempts in that style of versification these were only of very moderate merit one day he was struck with the idea of what could be done in this way he kept his room a whole day even went without his dinner and found that in the evening he had written twenty-three hexameters versifying a part of what he had before written in prose from that time pleased with his efforts he composed no more in prose to-day he informed me that he had finished his plan before he read milton he was enchanted to see an author who before him had trod the same path this is a contradiction of what he said before he did not wish to speak of his poem to any one till it was finished 
but some of his friends who had seen what he had finished tormented him till he had consented to publish a few books in a journal he was then i believe very young about twenty-five the rest was printed at different periods four books at a time the reception given to the first specimens was highly flattering he was nearly thirty years in finishing the whole poem but of these thirty years not more than two were employed in the composition he only composed in favourable moments besides he had other occupations he values himself upon the plan of his odes and accuses the modern lyrical writers of gross deficiency in this respect i laid the same accusation against horace he would not hear of it but waived the discussion he called rousseau's ode to fortune a moral dissertation in stanzas i spoke of dryden's st cecilia but he did not seem familiar with our writers he wished to know the distinctions between our dramatic and epic blank verse he recommended me to read his Hermann before I read either the Messiah or the Odes. He flattered himself that some time or other his dramatic poems would be known in England. He had not heard of Cooper. He thought that Voss, in his translation of the Iliad, had done violence to the idiom of the Germans, and had sacrificed it to the Greeks, not remembering sufficiently that each language has its particular spirit and genius. He said Lessing was the first of their dramatic writers. I complained of Nathan as tedious. He said there was not enough of action in it, but that lessing was the most chaste of their writers he spoke favourably of goethe but said that his sorrows of werther was his best work better than any of his dramas he preferred the first written to the rest of goethe's dramas schiller's robbers he found so extravagant that he could not read it i spoke of the scene of the setting sun he did not know it he said schiller could not live he thought don carlos the best of his dramas but said that the plot was inextricable it was evident he knew little of schiller's works indeed he said he could not read them Berger, he said, was a true poet, and would live, that Schiller, on the contrary, must soon be forgotten, that he gave himself up to the imitation of Shakespeare, who often was extravagant, but that Schiller was ten thousand times more so. He spoke very slightingly of Kotzebue, as an immoral author in the first place, and next as deficient in power. At Vienna, said he, they are transported with him, but we do not reckon the people of Vienna either the wisest or the wittiest people of Germany. He said Wieland was a charming author, and a sovereign master of his own language, that in this respect Goethe could not be compared to him, nor indeed could anybody else. He said that his fault was to be fertile to exuberance. I told him the Oberon had just been translated into English. He asked me if I was not delighted with the poem. I answered that I thought the story began to flag about the seventh or eighth book, and observed that it was unworthy of a man of genius to make the interest of a long poem turn entirely upon animal gratification. He seemed at first disposed to excuse us by saying that they are different subjects for poetry, and that poets are not willing to be restricted in their choice. I answered that I thought the passion of love as well suited to the purposes of poetry as any other passion, but that it was a cheap way of pleasing to fix the attention of the reader through a long poem on the mere appetite. Well, but, said he, you see that such poems please everybody. I answered that it was the province of a great poet to raise people up to his own level, not to descend to theirs. He agreed and confessed that on no account whatsoever would he have written a work like the Oberon. He spoke in raptures of Wieland's style, and pointed out the passage where Retzi is delivered of her child as exquisitely beautiful. I said that I did not perceive any very striking passages, but that I made allowance for the imperfections of a translation. Of the thefts of Wieland, he said they were so exquisitely managed that the greatest writers might be proud to steal as he did. He considered the books and fables of old romance writers in the light of the ancient mythology as a sort of common property from which a man was free to take whatever he could make a good use of. An Englishman had presented him with the odes of Collins, which he had read with pleasure. He knew little or nothing of Grey except his elegy written in a country churchyard. He complained of the fool in Lear, and observed that he seemed to give a terrible wildness to the distress, but still he complained. He asked whether it was not allowed that Pope had written rhyme poetry with more skill than any of our writers. I said I preferred Dryden because his couplets had greater variety in their movement. He thought my reason a good one, but asked whether the rhyme of Pope were not more exact. This question I understood as applying to the final terminations, and observed him that I believed it was the case, but that I thought it was easy to excuse some inaccuracy in the final sounds, if the general swap of the verse was superior. I told him that we were not so exact with regard to the final endings of the lines as the French. He did not seem to know that we made no distinction between masculine and feminine, i.e. single or double rhymes. At least he put inquiries to me on this subject. He seemed to think that no language could be so far formed as that it might not be enriched by idioms borrowed from another tongue. I said this was a very dangerous practice, and added that I thought Milton had often injured both his prose and verse 
by taking this liberty too frequently i recommended to him the prose works of dryden as models of pure and native english i was treading upon tender ground as i have reason to suppose that he has himself liberally indulged the practice the same day i dined at mr klopstock's where i had the pleasure of a third interview with the poet we talked principally about indifferent things i asked him what he thought of kant he said that his reputation was much on the decline in germany that for his own part he was not surprised to find it so as the works of kant were to him utterly incomprehensible that he had often been pestered by the kantians but was rarely in the practice of arguing with them his custom was to produce the book open it and point to a passage and beg they would explain it this they ordinarily attempted to do by substituting their own ideas i do not want i say an explanation of your own ideas but of the passage which is before us in this way i generally bring the dispute to an immediate conclusion he spoke of wolf as the first metaphysician they had in germany wolf had followers but they could hardly be called a sect and luckily till the appearance of kant about fifteen years ago germany had not been pestered by any sect of philosophers whatsoever but that each man had separately pursued his inquiries uncontrolled by the dogmas of a master kant had appeared ambitious to be the founder of a sect that he had succeeded but that the germans were now coming to their senses again that nikolai and engel had in different ways contributed to disenchant the nation but above all the incomprehensibility of the philosopher and his philosophy he seemed pleased to hear that as yet kant's doctrines had not met with many admirers in england did not doubt but that we had too much wisdom to be duped by a writer who set at defiance the common sense and common understandings of men we talked of tragedy he seemed to rate highly the power of exciting tears i said that nothing was more easy than to deluge an audience that it was done every day by the meanest writers i must remind you my friend first that these notes are not intended as specimens of klopstock's intellectual power or even colloquial prowess to judge of which by an accidental conversation and this with strangers and those two foreigners would be not only unreasonable but calumnious secondly i attribute little other interest to the remarks than what is derived from the celebrity of the person who made them lastly if you ask me whether i have read the messiah and what i think of it i answer as yet the first four books only and as to my opinion the reasons of which hereafter you may guess it from what i could not help muttering to myself when the good pastor this morning told me that klopstock was the german milton a very german milton indeed heaven preserve you and s t coleridge end of letter three chapter twenty three of biographia literaria this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by Nicole Lee, Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Chapter Twenty Three. Quid quod prefatione, premunierem libellum, qua conor omnem offendiculi ansam presidere, neque quid quam ad dubito, quin ea candidis omnibus faciat satis, quid autem facias istis, qui vel ob ingenii pertinaciam sibi satisfieri nolid, vel stupidiore sint, quam ut satisfactionem intelligent nam quem ad modum simonides dixit thessalos hebetiores esse quam ut possint asse decipi ita quosdam videa stupidiores quam ut placari queant ad haec non mirum est in venire quod calumnieto qui nihil aliud quaerit nisi quod calumnieto erasmus ad dorpium theologum in the refacimento of the friend i have inserted extracts from the consiones ad populum printed though scarcely published in the year seventeen ninety five in the very heat and height of my anti-ministerial enthusiasm these in proof that my principles of politics have sustained no change in the present chapter i have annexed to my letters from germany with particular reference to that which contains a disquisition on the modern drama a critique on the tragedy of bertram written within the last twelve months in proof that i have been as falsely charged with any fickleness in my principles of taste the letter was written to a friend and the apparent abruptness with which it begins is owing to the omission of the introductory sentences you remember my dear sir that mr whitbread shortly before his death proposed to the assembled subscribers of jury lane theatre that the concern should be farmed to some responsible individual under certain conditions and limitations and that his proposal was rejected not without indignation as subversive of the main object 
for the attainment of which the enlightened and patriotic assemblage of philo dramatists had been induced to risk their subscriptions now this object was avowed to be no less than the redemption of the british stage not only from horses dogs elephants and the like zoological rarities but also from the more pernicious barbarisms and kotzebuisms in morals and taste Drury lane was to be restored to its former classical renown shakespeare johnson and otway with the expurgated muses of ambrew congreve and Wycherley, were to be reinaugurated in their rightful dominion over british audiences and the herculean process was to commence by exterminating the speaking monsters imported from the banks of the danube compared with which their mute relations the emigrants from exeter change and polito late pidcock's show cart were tame and inoffensive could an heroic project at once so refined and so arduous be consistently entrusted to could its success be rationally expected from a mercenary manager at whose critical quarantine the lucri bonus odor would conciliate a bill of health to the plague in person no as the work proposed such must be the workmasters rank fortune liberal education and their natural accompaniments or consequences critical discernment delicate tact disinterestedness unsuspected morals notorious patriotism and tried mycenaeship these were the recommendations that influenced the votes of the proprietary subscribers of Drury lane theatre these the motives that occasioned the election of its supreme committee of management this circumstance alone would have excited a strong interest in the public mind respecting the first production of the tragic muse which had been announced under such auspices and had passed the ordeal of such judgments and the tragedy on which you have requested my judgment was the work on which the great expectations justified by so many causes were doomed at length to settle but before i enter on the examination of bertram or the castle of st aldobrand i shall interpose a few words on the phrase german drama which i hold to be altogether a misnomer at the time of lessing the german stage such as it was appears to have been a flat and servile copy of the french it was lessing who first introduced the name and the works of shakespeare to the admiration of the germans and i should not perhaps go too far if i add that it was lessing who first proved to all thinking men even to shakespeare's own countrymen the true nature of his apparent irregularities these he demonstrated were deviations only from the accidents of the greek tragedy and from such accidents as hung a heavy weight on the wings of the greek poets and narrowed their flight within the limits of what we may call the heroic opera he proved that in all the essentials of art no less than in the truth of nature the plays of shakespeare were incomparably more coincident with the principles of aristotle than the productions of corneille and racine notwithstanding the boasted regularity of the latter under these convictions were lessing's own dramatic works composed their deficiency is in depth and imagination their excellence is in the construction of the plot the good sense of the sentiments the sobriety of the morals and the high polish of the diction and dialogue in short his dramas are the very antipodes of all those which it has been the fashion of late years at once to abuse and enjoy under the name of the german drama of this latter schiller's robbers was the earliest specimen the first fruits of his youth i had almost said of his boyhood and as such the pledge and promise of no ordinary genius only as such did the maturer judgment of the author tolerate the play during his whole life he expressed himself concerning this production with more than needful asperity as a monster not less offensive to good taste than to sound morals and in his latter years his indignation at the unwonted popularity of the robbers seduced him into the contrary extremes viz a studied feebleness of interest as far as the interest was to be derived from incidents and the excitement of curiosity a diction elaborately metrical the affectation of rhymes and the pedantry of the chorus but to understand the true character of the robbers and of the countless imitations which were its spawn i must inform you or at least call to your recollection that about that time and for some years before it three of the most popular books in the german language were the translations of young's night thoughts harvey's meditations and richardson's clarissa harlowe now we have only to combine the bloated style and peculiar rhythm of harvey which is poetic only on account of its utter unfitness for prose and might as appropriately be called prosaic from its utter unfitness for poetry we have only i repeat to combine these harveyisms with the strained thoughts the figurative metaphysics and solemn epigrams of young on the one hand and with the loaded sensibility the minute detail the morbid consciousness of every thought and feeling in the whole flux and reflux of the mind in short the self-involution and dream-like continuity of richardson on the other hand and then to add the horrific incidents and mysterious villains geniuses of supernatural intellect if you will take the author's words for it 
but on a level with the meanest ruffians of the condemned cells if we are to judge by their actions and contrivances to add the ruined castles the dungeons the trap-doors the skeletons the flesh-and-blood ghosts and the perpetual moonshine of a modern author themselves the literary brood of the castle of otranto the translations of which with the imitations and improvements aforesaid were about that time beginning to make as much noise in germany as their originals were making in england and as the compound of these ingredients duly mixed you will recognise the so-called german drama the olla podrida thus cooked up was denounced by the best critics in germany as the mere cramps of weakness and orgasms of a sickly imagination on the part of the author and the lowest provocation of torpid feeling on that of the readers the old blunder however concerning the irregularity and wildness of shakespeare in which the german did but echo the french who again were but the echoes of our own critics was still in vogue and shakespeare was quoted as authority for the most anti-shakespearean drama we have indeed two poets who wrote as one near the age of shakespeare to whom as the worst characteristic of their writings the coryphaeus of the present drama may challenge the honour of being a poor relation or impoverished descendant for if we would charitably consent to forget the comic humour the wit the felicities of style in other words all the poetry and nine-tenths of all the genius of beaumont and fletcher that which would remain becomes a kotzebue the so-called german drama therefore is english in its origin english in its materials and english by readoption until we can prove that kotzebue or any of the whole breed of kotzebues whether dramatists or romantic writers or writers of romantic dramas were ever admitted to any other shelf in the libraries of well-educated germans than were occupied by their originals and apes apes in their mother country we should submit to carry our own brat on our own shoulders or rather consider it as a lack grace returned from transportation with such improvements only in growth and manners as young transported convicts usually come home with i know nothing that contributes more to a clearer insight into the true nature of any literary phenomenon than the comparison of it with some elder production the likeness of which is striking yet only apparent while the difference is real in the present case this opportunity is furnished us by the old spanish play entitled atheista fulminato formerly and perhaps still acted in the churches and monasteries of spain and which under various names don juan the libertine etc has had its day of favour in every country throughout europe a popularity so extensive and of a work so grotesque and extravagant claims and merits philosophical attention and investigation the first point to be noticed is that the play is throughout imaginative nothing of it belongs to the real world but the names of the places and persons the comic parts equally with the tragic the living equally with the defunct characters are creatures of the brain as little amenable to the rules of ordinary probability as the satan of paradise lost or the caliban of the tempest and therefore to be understood and judged of as impersonated abstractions rank fortune wit talent acquired knowledge and liberal accomplishments with beauty of person vigorous health and constitutional hardihood all these advantages elevated by the habits and sympathies of noble birth and national character are supposed to have combined in don juan so as to give him the means of carrying into all its practical consequences the doctrine of a godless nature as the sole ground and efficient cause not only of all things events and appearances but likewise of all our thoughts sensations impulses and actions obedience to nature is the only virtue the gratification of the passions and appetites her only dictate each individual self-will the sole organ through which nature utters her commands and self-contradiction is the only wrong for by the laws of spirit in the right is every individual character that acts in strict consistence with itself that speculative opinions however impious and daring they may be are not always followed by correspondent conduct is most true as well as that they can scarcely in any instance be systematically realised on account of their unsuitableness to human nature and to the institutions of society it can be hell only where it is all hell and a separate world of devils is necessary for the existence of any one complete devil but on the other hand it is no less clear nor with the biography of carrier and his fellow atheists before us can it be denied without wilful blindness that the so-called system of nature that is materialism with the utter rejection of moral responsibility of a present providence and of both present and future retribution may influence the characters and actions of individuals and even of communities to a degree that almost does away the distinction between men and devils and will make the page of the future historian resemble the narration of a madman's dreams it is not the wickedness of don juan therefore which constitutes the character an abstraction and removes it from the rules of probability but the rapid succession of the correspondent acts and incidents 
his intellectual superiority and the splendid accumulation of his gifts and desirable qualities as coexistent with entire wickedness in one and the same person but this likewise is the very circumstance which gives to this strange play its charm and universal interest don juan is from beginning to end an intelligible character as much so as the satan of milton the poet asks only of the reader what as a poet he is privileged to ask namely that sort of negative faith in the existence of such a being which we willingly give to productions professedly ideal and a disposition to the same state of feeling as that with which we contemplate the idealized figures of the apollo belvedere and the farnese hercules what the hercules is to the eye in corporeal strength don juan is to the mind in strength of character the ideal consists in the happy balance of the generic with the individual the former makes the character representative and symbolical therefore instructive because mutatis mutandis it is applicable to whole classes of men the latter gives it living interest for nothing lives or is real but as definite and individual to understand this completely the reader need only recollect the specific state of his feelings when in looking at a picture of the historic more properly of the poetic or heroic class he objects to a particular figure as being too much of a portrait and this interruption of his complacency he feels without the least reference to or the least acquaintance with any person in real life whom he might recognize in this figure it is enough that such a figure is not ideal and therefore not ideal because one of the two factors or elements of the ideal is in excess a similar and more powerful objection he would feel towards a set of figures which were mere abstractions like those of cipriani and what have been called greek forms and faces that is outlines drawn according to a recipe these again are not ideal because in these the other element is in excess forma formans per formam formatam translucens is the definition and perfection of ideal art this excellence is so happily achieved in the don juan that it is capable of interesting without poetry nay even without words as in our pantomime of that name we see clearly how the character is formed and the very extravagance of the incidents and the superhuman entireness of don juan's agency prevents the wickedness from shocking our minds to any painful degree we do not believe it enough for this effect no not even with that kind of temporary and negative belief or acquiescence which i have described above meantime the qualities of his character are too desirable too flattering to our pride and our wishes not to make up on this side as much additional faith as was lost on the other there is no danger thinks the spectator or reader of my becoming such a monster of iniquity as don juan i never shall be an atheist i shall never disallow all distinction between right and wrong i have not the least inclination to be so outrageous a draw cancer in my love affairs but to possess such a power of captivating and enchanting the affections of the other sex to be capable of inspiring in a charming and even a virtuous woman a love so deep and so entirely personal to me that even my worst vices if i were vicious even my cruelty and perfidy if i were cruel and perfidious could not eradicate the passion to be so loved for my own self that even with a distinct knowledge of my character she had died to save me this sir takes hold of two sides of our nature the better and the worse for the heroic disinterestedness to which love can transport a woman cannot be contemplated without an honourable emotion of reverence towards womanhood and on the other hand it is among the miseries and abides in the dark groundwork of our nature to crave an outward confirmation of that something within us which is our very self that something not made up of our qualities and relations but itself the supporter and substantial basis of all these love me and not my qualities may be a vicious and an insane wish but it is not a wish wholly without a meaning without power virtue would be insufficient and incapable of revealing its being it would resemble the magic transformation of tasso's heroine into a tree in which she could only groan and bleed hence power is necessarily an object of our desire and of our admiration but of all power that of the mind is on every account the grand desideratum of human ambition we shall be as gods in knowledge was and must have been the first temptation and the coexistence of great intellectual lordship with guilt has never been adequately represented without exciting the strongest interest and for this reason that in this bad and heterogeneous coordination we can contemplate the intellect of man more exclusively as a separate self-subsistence than in its proper state of subordination to his own conscience or to the will of an infinitely superior being this is the sacred charm of shakespeare's male characters in general they are all cast in the mould of shakespeare's own gigantic intellect and this is the open attraction of his richard iago edmund and others in particular but again of all intellectual power that of superiority to the fear of the invisible world is the most dazzling its influence is abundantly proved by the one circumstance 
that it can bribe us into a voluntary submission of our better knowledge into suspension of all our judgment derived from constant experience and enable us to peruse with the liveliest interest the wildest tales of ghosts wizards genii and secret talismans on this propensity so deeply rooted in our nature a specific dramatic probability may be raised by a true poet if the whole of his work be in harmony a dramatic probability sufficient for dramatic pleasure even when the component characters and incidents border on impossibility the poet does not require us to be awake and believe he solicits us only to yield ourselves to a dream and this too with our eyes open and with our judgment perdue behind the curtain ready to awaken us at the first motion of our will and meantime only not to disbelieve and in such a state of mind who but must be impressed with the cool intrepidity of don john on the appearance of his father's ghost ghost monster behold these wounds don john i do they were well meant and well performed i see ghost repent repent of all thy villainies my clamorous blood to heaven for vengeance cries heaven will pour out his judgments on you all hell gapes for you for you each fiend doth call and hourly waits your unrepenting fall you with eternal horrors they'll torment except of all your crimes you suddenly repent ghost sings don john farewell thou art a foolish ghost repent quoth he what could this mean our senses are all in a mist sure don antonio one of don juan's reprobate companions they are not twas a ghost don lopez another reprobate i ne'er believed those foolish tales before don john come tis no matter let it be what it will it must be natural don antonio our nature is unalterable in us too don john tis true the nature of a ghost cannot change ours who also can deny a portion of sublimity to the tremendous consistency with which he stands out the last fearful trial like a second prometheus chorus of devils statue ghost will you not relent and feel remorse don john couldst thou bestow another heart on me i might but with this heart i have i cannot don lopez these things are prodigious don antonio i have a sort of grudging to relent but something holds me back don lopez if we could tis now too late i will not don antonio we defy thee ghost perish ye impious wretches go and find the punishments laid up in store for you thunder and lightning don lopez and don antonio are swallowed up ghost to don john behold their dreadful fates and know that thy last moments come don john think not to fright me foolish ghost i'll break your marble body in pieces and pull down your horse thunder and lightning chorus of devils etc don john these things i see with wonder but no fear were all the elements to be confounded and shuffled all into their former chaos were seas of sulphur flaming round about me and all mankind roaring within those fires i could not fear or feel the least remorse to the last instant i would dare thy power here i stand firm and all thy threats contemn thy murderer to the ghost of one whom he had murdered stands here now do thy worst he is swallowed up in a cloud of fire in fine the character of don john consists in the union of everything desirable to human nature as means and which therefore by the well-known law of association becomes at length desirable on their own account on their own account and in their own dignity they are here displayed as being employed to ends so unhuman that in the effect they appear almost as means without an end the ingredients too are mixed in the happiest proportion so as to uphold and relieve each other more especially in that constant interpoise of wit gaiety and social generosity which prevents the criminal even in his most atrocious moments from sinking into the mere ruffian as far at least as our imagination sits in judgment above all the fine suffusion through the whole with the characteristic manners and feelings of a highly bred gentleman gives life to the drama thus having invited the statue ghost of the governor whom he had murdered to supper which invitation the marble ghost accepted by a nod of the head don john has prepared a banquet don john some wine sirrah here's to don pedro's ghost he should have been welcome on lopez the rascal is afraid of you after death one knocks hard at the door don john to the servant rise and do your duty servant oh the devil the devil marble ghost enters don john ha tis the ghost let's rise and receive him come governor you are welcome sit there if we had thought you would have come we would have stayed for you here governor your health friends put it about here's excellent meat taste of this ragout come i'll help you 
Come eat, and let old quarrels be forgotten. The ghost threatens him with vengeance. Don John. We are too much confirmed. Curse on this dry discourse. Come, here's to your mistress. You had one when you were living, not forgetting your sweet sister. Devil sent her. Don John. Are these some of your retinue? Devil, say you. I'm sorry I have no burnt brandy to treat him with. That's drink fit for devils, etc. Nor is the scene from which we quote interesting in dramatic probability alone. It is susceptible likewise of a sound moral, of a moral that has more than common claims, on the notice of a too numerous class, who are ready to receive the qualities of gentlemanly courage and scrupulous honour, in all the recognised laws of honour, as the substitutes of virtue, instead of its ornaments. This, indeed, is the moral value of the play at large, and that which places it at a world's distance from the spirit of modern Jacobinism. The latter introduces to us clumsy copies of these showy instrumental qualities, in order to reconcile us to vice and want of principle, while the atheist of Fulminato presents an exquisite portraiture of the same qualities, in all their gloss and glow, but presents them for the sole purpose of displaying their hollowness, and in order to put us on our guard by demonstrating their utter indifference to vice and virtue, whenever these and the like accomplishments are contemplated for themselves alone. Eighteen years ago I observed that the whole secret of the modern Jacobinical drama, which, and not the German, is its appropriate designation, and of all its popularity, consists in the confusion and subversion of the natural order of things in their causes and effects, namely in the excitement of surprise by representing the qualities of liberality, refined feeling, and a nice sense of honour, those things rather which pass amongst us for such, in persons and in classes, where experience teaches us least to expect them, and by rewarding with all the sympathies which are the due of virtue, those criminals whom law, reason, and religion have excommunicated from our esteem. This of itself would lead me back to Bertram, or the castle of St. Aldebrand, but in my own mind this tragedy was brought into connection with the Libertine, Shadwell's adaptation of the atheist of Fulminato to the English stage, in the reign of Charles the Second, by the fact that our modern drama is taken in the substance of it from the first scene of the third act of the Libertine, but with what palpable superiority of judgment in the original. Earth and hell, men and spirits, are up in arms against Don John. The two former acts of the play have not only prepared us for the supernatural, but accustomed us to the prodigious. It is therefore neither more nor less than we anticipate when the captain exclaims, In all the dangers I have been, such horrors I never knew, I am quite unmanned. And when the hermit says that he had beheld the ocean in wildest rage, yet ne'er before saw a storm so dreadful, such horrid flashes of lightning and such claps of thunder were never in my remembrance. And Don John's burst of startling impiety is equally intelligible in its motive, as dramatic in its effect. But what is there to account for the prodigy of the tempest at Bertram Shipwreck? It is a mere supernatural effect, without even a hint of any supernatural agency, a prodigy, without any circumstance mentioned that is prodigious, and a miracle introduced without a ground, and ending without a result. Every event and every scene of the play might have taken place as well, if Bertram and his vessel had been driven in by a common hard gale, or from want of provisions. The first act would have indeed lost its greatest and most sonorous picture, a scene for the sake of a scene without a word spoken, as such, therefore, a rarity without a precedent, we must take it, and be thankful. In the opinion of not a few, it was, in every sense of the word, the best scene in the play. I am quite certain it was the most innocent, and the steady, quiet uprightness of the flame of the wax candles, which the monks held over the roaring billows amid the storm of wind and rain, was really miraculous. The Sicilian sea-coast, a convent of monks, night, a most portentous unearthly storm, a vessel is wrecked contrary to all human expectation, one man saves himself by his prodigious powers as a swimmer, aided by the peculiarity of his destination. Prior. All, all did perish. First monk. Change, change those drenched weeds. Prior. I wist not of them. Every soul did perish. Enter third monk hastily. Third monk. No, there was one did battle with the storm with callous desperate force. Full many times his life was won and lost, as though he wrecked not. No hand did aid him, and he aided none. Alone he breasted the broad wave. Alone that man was saved. Well, this man is led in by the monks, suppose dripping wet, and to very natural inquiries he either remains silent, or gives most brief and surly answers, and after three or four of these half-line courtesies, dashing off the monks who had saved him, he exclaims in the true sublimity of our modern misanthropic heroism, Off! Ye are men, there's poison in your touch, but I must yield for this, what, hath left me strengthless. So end the three first scenes. 
In the next, the castle of St. Aldebrand, we find the servants there equally frightened with this unearthly storm, though wherein it differed from other violent storms we are not told, except that Hugo informs us, page 9. Pietro. Hugo well met. Does e'en thy age bear memory of so terrible a storm? Hugo. They have been frequent lately. Pietro. They are ever so in Sicily. Hugo. So it is said. But storms when I was young would still pass o'er like nature's fitful fevers, and rendered all more wholesome. Now their rage, sent thus unseasonable and profitless, speaks like the threats of heaven. A most perplexing theory of Sicilian storms is this of old Hugo. And what is very remarkable, not apparently founded on any great familiarity of his own with this troublesome article, for when Pietro asserts the ever more frequency of tempests in Sicily, the old man professes to know nothing more of the fact, but by hearsay. So it is said. But why he assumed this storm to be unseasonable, and on what he grounded his prophecy, for the storm is still in full fury, that it would be profitless, and without the physical powers common to all other violent sea-winds in purifying the atmosphere, we are left in the dark, as well concerning the particular points in which he knew it, during its continuance, to differ from those that he had been acquainted with in his youth. We are at length introduced to the Lady Imogen, who, we learn, had not rested through the night, not on account of the tempest, for, long ere the storm arose, her restless gestures forbade all hope to see her blessed with sleep. Sitting at a table and looking at a portrait, she informs us, first, that portrait painters may make a portrait from memory, the limner's art may trace the absent feature, for well, surely these words could never mean, that a painter may have a person sit to him who afterwards may leave the room or perhaps the country. Secondly, that a portrait painter can enable a mourning lady to possess a good likeness of her absent lover, but that the portrait painter cannot, and who shall, restore the scenes in which they met and parted. The natural answer would have been, why the scene-painter, to be sure. But this unreasonable lady requires, in addition, sundry things to be painted, that have neither lines nor colours the thoughts, the recollections, sweet and bitter, or the Elysian dreams of lovers when they loved, which last sentence must be supposed to mean when they were present and making love to each other, then, if this portrait could speak, it would acquit the faith of womankind. How? Has she remained constant? No. She has been married to another man, whose wife she now is. How, then? Why, that, in spite of her marriage vow, she had continued to yearn and crave for her former lover. This has her body, that her mind which has the better bargain. The lover, however, was not contented with this precious arrangement, as we shall soon find. The lady proceeds to inform us that during the many years of their separation there have happened in the different parts of the world a number of such things, even such as in a course of years always have, and till the millennium doubtless always will happen, somewhere or other. Yet this passage, both in language and in metre, is perhaps amongst the best parts of the play. The lady's love companion and most esteemed attendant, Clotilda, now enters, and explains this love and esteem by proving herself a most passive and dispassionate listener, as well as a brief and lucky querist, who asked by chance questions that we should have thought made for the very sake of the answers. In short, she very much reminds us of those puppet heroines, for whom the showman contrives to dialogue without any skill in ventriloquism. This notwithstanding is the best scene in the play, and though crowded with solecisms, corrupt diction, and offences against metre, would possess merit sufficient to outweigh them, if we could suspend the moral sense during the perusal. It tells well and passionately the preliminary circumstances, and thus overcomes the main difficulty of most first acts, to wit, that of retrospective narration. It tells us of her having been honourably addressed by a noble youth, of rank and fortune, vastly superior to her own, of their mutual love, heightened on her part by gratitude, of his loss of his sovereign's favour, his disgrace, attainder, and flight, that he, thus degraded, sank into a vile ruffian, the chieftain of a murderous banditti, and that from the habitual indulgence of the most reprobate habits and ferocious passions, he had become so changed even in appearance and features, that she who bore him had recoiled from him, nor known the alien visage of her child, yet still she, Imogen, loved him. She is compelled by the silent entreaties of her father, perishing with bitter shameful want on the cold earth, to give her hand, with a heart thus irrecoverably pre-engaged, to Lord Aldebrand, the enemy of her lover, even to the very man who had baffled his ambitious schemes, and was, at the present time, entrusted with the execution of the sentence of death which had been passed on Bertram. Now the proof of woman's love, so industriously held forth for the sympathy, if not for the esteem of the audience, consists in this, that, though Bertram had become a robber and a murderer by trade, a ruffian in manners, yea, with form and features at which his own mother could not but recoil, 
yet she lady imogen the wife of a most noble honoured lord estimable as a man exemplary and affectionate as a husband and the fond father of her only child but she notwithstanding all this striking her heart dares to say to it but thou art bertram still and bertram's ever a monk now enters and entreats in his prior's name for the wonted hospitality and free noble usage of the castle of st aldobrand for some wretched shipwrecked souls and from this we learn for the first time to our infinite surprise that notwithstanding the supernaturalness of the storm aforesaid not only bertram but the whole of his gang had been saved by what means we are left to conjecture and can only conclude that they had all the same desperate swimming powers and the same saving destiny as the hero bertram himself so ends the first act and with it the tale of the events both those with which the tragedy begins and those which had occurred previous to the date of its commencement the second displays bertram in disturbed sleep which the prior who hangs over him prefers calling a starting trance and with a strained voice that would have awakened one of the seven sleepers observes to the audience how the lip works how the bare teeth do grind and beaded drops course down his writhen brow the dramatic effect of which passage we not only concede to the admirers of this tragedy but acknowledge the further advantages of preparing the audience for the most surprising series of wry faces proflated mouths and lunatic gestures that were ever launched on an audience to sear the sense prior i will awake him from this horrid trance this is no natural sleep ho wake thee stranger this is rather a whimsical application of the verb reflex we must confess though we remember a similar transfer of the agent to the patient in a manuscript tragedy in which the bertram of the piece prostrating a man with a single blow of his fist exclaims knock me thee down then ask thee if thou livest well the stranger obeys and whatever his sleep might have been his waking was perfectly natural for the lethargy itself could not withstand the scolding stentorship of mr holland the prior we next learn from the best authority his own confession that the misanthropic hero whose destiny was incompatible with drowning is count bertram who not only reveals his past fortunes but avows with open atrocity his satanic hatred of imogen's lord and his frantic thirst of revenge and so the raving character raves and the scolding character scolds and what else does not the prior act does he not send for a posse of constables or thief-takers to handcuff the villain or take him either to bedlam or newgate nothing of the kind the author preserves the unity of character and the scolding prior from first to last does nothing but scold with the exception indeed of the last scene of the last act in which with a most surprising revolution he whines weeps and kneels to the condemned blaspheming assassin out of pure affection to the high-hearted man the sublimity of whose angel sin rivals the star-bright apostate that is who was as proud as lucifer and as wicked as the devil and had thrilled him prior holland aforesaid with wild admiration accordingly in the very next scene we have this tragic macheath with his whole gang in the castle of st aldobrand without any attempt on the prior's part either to prevent him or to put the mistress and servants of the castle on their guard against their new inmates though he the prior knew and confesses that he knew that bertram's fearful mates were assassins so habituated and naturalized to guilt that when their drenched hold forsook both gold and gear they gripped their daggers with a murderous instinct and though he also knew that bertram was the leader of a band whose trade was blood to the castle however he goes thus with the holy prior's consent if not with his assistance and thither let us follow him no sooner is our hero safely housed in the castle of st aldobrand than he attracts the notice of the lady and her confidant by his wild and terrible dark eyes muffled form fearful form darkly wild proudly stern and the like commonplace indefinites seasoned by merely verbal antitheses and at best copied with very slight change from the conrad of southey's joan of arc the lady imogen who has been as is the case she tells us with all soft and solemn spirits worshipping the moon on a terrace or rampart within view of the castle insists on having an interview with our hero and this too tete-a-tete -tete. would the reader learn why and wherefore the confidant is excluded who very properly remonstrates against such conference alone at night with one who bears such fearful form the reason follows why therefore send him i say follows because the next line all things of fear have lost their power over me is separated from the former by a break or pause and besides that it is a very poor answer to the danger is no answer at all to the gross indelicacy of this wilful exposure we must therefore regard it as a mere afterthought that a little softens the rudeness but adds nothing to the weight of that exquisite woman's reason aforesaid 
and so exit clotilda and enter bertram who stands without looking at her that is with his lower limbs forked his arms akimbo his side to the lady's front the whole figure resembling an inverted y he is soon however roused from the state surly to the state frantic and then follow raving yelling cursing she fainting he relenting in runs imogen's child squeaks mother he snatches it up and with a god bless thee child bertram has kissed thy child the curtain drops the third act is short and short be our account of it it introduces lord st aldebrand on his road homeward and next imogen in the convent confessing the foulness of her heart to the prior who first indulges his old humour with a fit of senseless scolding then leaves her alone with a ruffian paramour with whom she makes at once an infamous appointment and the curtain drops that it may be carried into act and consummation i want words to describe the mingled horror and disgust with which i witnessed the opening of the fourth act considering it as a melancholy proof of the depravation of the public mind the shocking spirit of jacobinism seemed no longer confined to politics the familiarity with atrocious events and characters appeared to have poisoned the taste even where it had not directly disorganized the moral principles and left the feelings callous to all the mild appeals and craving alone for the grossest and most outrageous stimulants the very fact then present to our senses that a british audience could remain passive under such an insult to common decency nay receive with a thunder of applause a human being supposed to have come reeking from the consummation of this complex foulness and baseness these and the like reflections so pressed as with the weight of lead upon my heart that actor author and tragedy would have been forgotten had it not been for a plain elderly man sitting beside me who with a very serious face that at once expressed surprise and aversion touched my elbow and pointing to the actor said to me in a half whisper do you see that little fellow there he's just been committing adultery somewhat relieved by the laugh which this droll address occasioned i forced back my attention to the stage sufficiently to learn that bertram is recovered from a transient fit of remorse by the information that st aldebrand was commissioned to do what every honest man must have done without commission if he did his duty to seize him and deliver him to the just vengeance of the law an information which as he had long known himself to be an attainted traitor and proclaimed outlaw and not only a trader in blood himself but notoriously the captain of a gang of thieves pirates and assassins assuredly could not have been new to him it is this however which alone and instantly restores him to his accustomed state of raving blasphemy and nonsense next follows imogen's constrained interview with her injured husband and his sudden departure again all in love and kindness in order to attend the feast of st anselm at the convent this was it must be owned a very strange engagement for so tender a husband to make within a few minutes after so long an absence but first his lady has told him that she has a vow on her and wishes that black perdition may gulf her perjured soul no nope, she is lying at the very time if she ascends his bed till her penance is accomplished how therefore is the poor husband to amuse himself in this interval of her penance but do not be distressed reader on account of the st aldebrand's absence as the author has contrived to send him out of the house when a husband would be in his and the lover's way so he will doubtless not be at a loss to bring him back again as soon as he is wanted well the husband gone in on the one side out pops the lover from the other and for the fiendish purpose of harrowing up the soul of his wretched accomplice in guilt by announcing to her with most brutal and blasphemous execrations his fixed and deliberate resolve to assassinate her husband all this too is for no discoverable purpose on the part of the author but that of introducing a series of super-tragic starts pauses screams struggling dagger-throwing falling on the ground starting up again wildly swearing outcries for help falling again on the ground rising again faintly tottering towards the door and to end the scene a most convenient fainting fit of our ladies just in time to give bertrand an opportunity of seeking the object of his hatred before she alarms the house which indeed she has had full time to have done before but that the author rather chose she should amuse herself and the audience by the above described ravings and startings she recovers slowly and to her enter clotilda the confidant and mother confessor then commences what in theatrical language is called the madness but which the author more accurately entitles delirium it appearing indeed a sort of intermittent fever with fits of light-headedness off and on whenever occasion and stage effect happen to call for it a convenient return of the storm we told the reader beforehand how it would be had changed the rivulet that bathed the convent walls into a foaming flood upon its brink the lord and his small train do stand appalled with torch and bell from their high battlements the monks do summon to the pass in vain he must return to-night 
talk of the devil and his horns appear says the proverb and sure enough within ten lines of the exit of the messenger sent to stop him the arrival of lord st aldebrand is announced bertram's ruffian band now enter and range themselves across the stage giving fresh cause for imogen's screams and madness st aldebrand having received his mortal wound behind the scenes totters in to welter in his blood and to die at the feet of this double damned adulteress of her as far as she is concerned in this fourth act we have two additional points to notice first the low cunning and jesuitical trick with which she deludes her husband into words of forgiveness which she himself does not understand and secondly that everywhere she is made the object of interest and sympathy and it is not the author's fault if at any moment she excites feelings less gentle than those we are accustomed to associate with the self-accusations of a sincere religious penitent and did a british audience endure all this they received it with plaudits which but for the rivalry of the carts and hackney coaches might have disturbed the evening prayers of the scanty week-day congregation at st paul's cathedral tempora mutantur nos et mutamo in illis of the fifth act the only thing noticeable for rant and nonsense though abundant as ever have long before the last act become things of course is the profane representation of the high altar in a chapel with all the vessels and other preparations for the holy sacrament a hymn is actually sung on the stage by the chorister boys for the rest imogen who now and then talks deliriously but who is always light-headed as far as her gown and hair can make her so wanders about in dark woods with cavern rocks and precipices in the back scene and a number of mute dramatis personae move in and out continually for whose presence there is always at least this reason that they afford something to be seen by that very large part of a dreary lane audience who have small chance of hearing a word she had it appears taken her child with her but what becomes of the child whether she murdered it or not nobody can tell nobody can learn it was a riddle at the representation and after a most attentive perusal of the play a riddle it remains no more i know i wish i did and i would tell it all to you for what became of this poor child there's none that ever knew our whole information is derived from the following words prior where is thy child clotilde pointing to the cavern into which she has looked oh he lies cold within his cavern tomb why dost thou urge her with the horrid theme prior who will not the reader may observe be disappointed of his doze of scolding it was to make query wake one living chord o the heart and i will try though my own breaks at it where is thy child imogen with a frantic laugh the forest fiend hath snatched him he who the fiend or the child rides the nightmare through the wizard woods now these two lines consist in a senseless plagiarism from the counterfeited madness of edgar in lear who in imitation of the gypsy incantations puns on the old word mare a hag and the no less senseless adoption of dryden's forest fiend and the wizard stream by which milton in his lycidas so finely characterizes the spreading diva fabulosus amnis observe too these images stand unique in the speeches of imogen without the slightest resemblance to anything she says before or after but we are weary the characters in this act frisk about here there and everywhere as teasingly as the jack-o'-lantern lights which mischievous boys from across a narrow street throw with a looking-glass on the faces of their opposite neighbours bertram disarmed out heroding charles de moor in the robbers befaces the collected knights of st anselm all in complete armour and so by pure dint of black looks he outdares them into passive poltroons the sudden revolution in the prior's manners we have before noticed and it is indeed so outre that a number of the audience imagined a great secret was to come out viz that the prior was one of the many instances of a youthful sinner metamorphosed into an old scold and that this bertram would appear at last to be his son imogen reappears at the convent and dies of her own accord bertram stabs himself and dies by her side and that the play may conclude as it began to wit in a superfetation of blasphemy upon nonsense because he had snatched a sword from a despicable coward who retreats in terror when it is pointed towards him in sport this fellow de say and thief captain this loathsome and leprous confluence of robbery adultery murder and cowardly assassination this monster whose best deed is the having saved his betters from the degradation of hanging him by turning jack ketch to himself first recommends the charitable monks and holy prior to pray for his soul and then has the folly and impudence to exclaim i die no felon's death a warrior's weapon freed a warrior's soul End of chapter twenty three
Chapter twenty four of Biographia Literaria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Chapter twenty four. Conclusion. It sometimes happens that we are punished for our faults by incidents in the causation of which these faults had no share, and this I have always felt the severest punishment. The wound, indeed, is of the same dimensions, but the edges are jagged, and there is a dull underpain that survives the smart which it had aggravated. For there is always a consolatory feeling that accompanies the sense of a proportion between antecedents and consequence. The sense of before and after becomes both intelligible and intellectual when, and only when, we contemplate the succession in the relations of cause and effect which like the two poles of the magnet manifest the being and unity of the one power by relative opposites and give as it were a substratum of permanence of identity and therefore of reality to the shadowy flux of time it is eternity revealing itself in the phenomena of time and the perception and acknowledgment of the proportionality and appropriateness of the present to the past prove to the afflicted soul that it has not yet been deprived of the sight of god that it can still recognise the effective presence of a father, though through a darkened glass and a turbid atmosphere, though of a father that is chastising it. And for this cause, doubtless, are we so framed in mind, and even so organised in brain and nerve, that all confusion is painful. It is within the experience of many medical practitioners that a patient with strange and unusual symptoms of disease has been more distressed in mind, more wretched, from the fact of being unintelligible to himself and others, than from the pain or danger of the disease nay that the patient has received the most solid comfort and resumed a genial and enduring cheerfulness from some new symptom or product that had at once determined the name and nature of his complaint and rendered it an intelligible effect of an intelligible cause even though the discovery did at the same moment preclude all hope of restoration hence the mystic theologians whose delusions we may more confidently hope to separate from their actual intuitions when we condescend to read their works without the presumption that whatever our fancy always the ape and too often the adulterator and counterfeit of our memory has not made or cannot make a picture of must be nonsense hence i say the mystics have joined in representing the state of the reprobate spirits as a dreadful dream in which there is no sense of reality not even of the pangs they are enduring an eternity without time, and as it were below it, God present without manifestation of his presence. But these are depths which we dare not linger over. Let us turn to an instance more on a level with the ordinary sympathies of mankind. Here then, and in this same healing influence of light and distinct beholding, we may detect the final cause of that instinct which, in the great majority of instances, leads and almost compels the afflicted to communicate their sorrows hence too flows the alleviation that results from opening out our griefs which are thus presented in distinguishable forms instead of the mist through which whatever is shapeless becomes magnified and literally enormous casimir in the fifth ode of his third book has happily expressed this thought me longa silendi edit amor facilesque luctus hausit medulas fugerit ocius simul negantem vis regiusuris ares amicorum et loquasem questibus evacuaris iram olim currendo destinimus queri ipsoque fletu lacrima perditu nec fortis aeque si per omnes cura volat residetque ramos vires amices perdit in auribus minorque semper dividitu dolor per multa permissus vagari pectora i shall not make this an excuse however for troubling my readers with any complaints or explanations with which, as readers, they have little or no concern. It may suffice for the present at least to declare that the causes that have delayed the publication of these volumes for so long a period after they had been printed off were not connected with any neglect of my own, and that they would form an instructive comment on the character concerning authorship as a trade addressed to young men of genius in the first volume of this work. I remember the ludicrous effect produced on my mind by the fast sentence of an autobiography which, happily for the writer, was as meagre in instance as it is well possible for the life of an individual to be. The eventful life which I am about to record from the hour in which I rose into existence on this planet, etc., yet when, notwithstanding this warning example of importance before me, I review my own life, I cannot refrain from applying the same epithet to it, and with more than ordinary emphasis, and no private feeling that affected myself only should prevent me from publishing the same.
for write it i assuredly shall should life and leisure be granted me if continued reflection should strengthen my present belief that my history would add its contingent to the enforcement of one important truth to wit that we must not only love our neighbours as ourselves but ourselves likewise as our neighbours and that we can do neither unless we love god above both who lives that's not depraved or depraves who dies that bears not one spurn to the grave of their friend's gift strange as the delusion may appear yet it is most true that three years ago i did not know or believe that i had an enemy in the world and now even my strongest sensations of gratitude are mingled with fear and i reproach myself for being too often disposed to ask have i one friend during the many years which intervened between the composition and the publication of the christabel it became almost as well known among literary men as if it had been on common sale the same references were made to it and the same liberties taken with it even to the very names of the imaginary persons in the poem from almost all of our most celebrated poets and from some with whom i had no personal acquaintance i either received or heard of expressions of admiration that i can truly say appeared to myself utterly disproportionate to a work that pretended to be nothing more than a common fairy tale many who had allowed no merit to my other poems whether printed or manuscript and who have frankly told me as much uniformly made an exception in favour of the christabel and the poem entitled love year after year and in societies of the most different kinds i had been entreated to recite it and the result was still the same in all and altogether different in this respect from the effect produced by the occasional recitation of any other poems i had composed this before the publication and since then with very few exceptions i have heard nothing but abuse and this too in a spirit of bitterness at least as disproportionate to the pretensions of the poem had it been the most pitiably below mediocrity as the previous eulogies and far more inexplicable this may serve as a warning to authors that in their calculations on the probable reception of a poem they must subtract to a large amount from the panegyric which may have encouraged them to publish it however unsuspicious and however various the sources of this panegyric may have been and first allowances must be made for private enmity of the very existence of which they had perhaps entertained no suspicion for personal enmity behind the mask of anonymous criticism secondly for the necessity of a certain proportion of abuse and ridicule in a review in order to make it saleable in consequence of which if they have no friends behind the scenes the chance must needs be against them but lastly and chiefly for the excitement and temporary sympathy of feeling which the recitation of the poem by an admirer especially if he be at once a warm admirer and a man of acknowledged celebrity calls forth in the audience for this is really a species of animal magnetism in which the enkindling reciter by perpetual comment of looks and tones lends his own will and apprehensive faculty to his auditors they live for the time within the dilated sphere of his intellectual being it is equally possible though not equally common that a reader left to himself should sink below the poem as that the poem left to itself should flag beneath the feelings of the reader but in my own instance i had the additional misfortune of having been gossiped about as devoted to metaphysics and worse than all to a system incomparably nearer to the visionary flights of plato and even to the jargon of the mystics than to the established tenets of locke whatever therefore appeared with my name was condemned beforehand as predestined metaphysics in a dramatic poem which had been submitted by me to a gentleman of great influence in the theatrical world occurred the following passage o oh, we are querulous creatures little less than all things can suffice to make us happy and little more than nothing is enough to make us wretched ay here now exclaimed the critic here come coleridge's metaphysics and the very same motive that is not that the lines were unfit for the present state of our immense theatres but that they were metaphysics was assigned elsewhere for the rejection of the two following passages the first is spoken in answer to a usurper who had rested his plea on the circumstance that he had been chosen by the acclamations of the people what people how convened or if convened must not the magic power that charms together millions of men in council needs have power to win or wield them rather oh far rather shout forth thy titles to yon circling mountains and with a thousandfold reverberation make the rocks flatter thee and the volleying air unbribed shout back to thee king emmerich by wholesome laws to embank the sovereign power to deepen by restraint and by prevention of lawless will to amass and guide the flood in its majestic channel is man's task and the true patriot's glory in all else men safely trust to heaven than to themselves when least themselves even in those whirling crowds where folly is contagious and too oft even wise men leave their better sense at home to chide and wonder at them when returned 
The second passage is in the mouth of an old and experienced courtier, betrayed by the man in whom he had most trusted. And yet Sir Alter, simple, inexperienced, could see him as he was, and often warn me. Whence learned she this? Oh, she was innocent. And to be innocent is nature's wisdom. The fledged dove knows the prowlers of the air, feared soon is seen, and flutters back to shelter, and the young steed recoils upon his haunches, the never-yet-seen adder's hiss first heard. O oh, surer than suspicion's hundred eyes is that fine sense, which to the pure in heart, by mere oppugnancy of their own goodness, reveals the approach of evil. As therefore my character as a writer could not easily be more injured by an overt act than it was already in consequence of the report, I published a work, a large portion of which was professedly metaphysical. A long delay occurred between its first enunciation and its appearance. It was reviewed, therefore, by anticipation with a malignity so avowedly and exclusively personal as is, I believe, unprecedented even in the present contempt of all common humanity that disgraces and endangers the liberty of the press. After its appearance, the author of this lampoon undertook to review it in the Edinburgh Review, and under the single condition that he should have written what he himself really thought, and have criticised the work as he would have done had its author been indifferent to him, I should have chosen that man myself, both from the vigour and the originality of his mind, and from his particular acuteness in speculative reasoning before all others. I remember Catullus's lines. Desine de quoquam quicquam bene vele mereri, aut aliquam fieri posse putare pium. Omnia sunt ingrata, nihil fecise benigne est, imo etiam taedet, taedet obesque magis. Ud mihi quem nemo gravius nec acerbius urget, quam modo qui me unum atque unicum amicum habuit. But I can truly say that the grief with which I read this rhapsody of predetermined insult had the rhapsodist himself for its whole and sole object. I refer to this review at present, in consequence of information having been given me, that the innuendo of my potential infidelity, grounded on one passage of my first lay sermon, has been received and propagated with a degree of credence, of which I can safely acquit the originator of the calumny. I give the sentences as they stand in the sermon, premising only that I was speaking exclusively of miracles worked for the outward senses of men. It was only to overthrow the usurpation exercised in and through the senses, that the senses were miraculously appealed to. Reason and religion are their own evidence. The natural sun is in this respect a symbol of the spiritual. Ere he is fully arisen, and while his glories are still under veil, he calls up the breeze to chase away the usurping vapours of the night season, and thus converts the air itself into the minister of its own purification, not surely in proof or elucidation of the light from heaven, but to prevent its interception. Wherever, therefore, similar circumstances coexist with the same moral causes, the principles revealed and the examples recorded in the inspired writings render miracles superfluous, and if we neglect to apply truths in expectation of wonders, or under pretext of the cessation of the latter, we tempt God and merit the same reply which our Lord gave to the Pharisees, on a like occasion. In the sermon and the notes, both the historical truth and the necessity of the miracles are strongly and frequently asserted. The testimony of books of history, that is, relatively to the signs and wonders with which Christ came, is one of the strong and stately pillars of the church, but it is not the foundation. Instead, therefore, of defending myself, which I could easily effect by a series of passages expressing the same opinion, from the fathers and the most eminent Protestant divines, from the Reformation to the Revolution, I shall merely state what my belief is concerning the true evidences of Christianity. 1. Its consistency with right reason, I consider as the outer court of the temple, the common area within which it stands. 2. The miracles, with and through which the religion was first revealed and attested, I regard as the steps, the vestibule, and the portal of the temple. 3. The sense, the inward feeling, in the soul of each believer of its exceeding desirableness, the experience that he needs something, joined with the strong foretokening, that the redemption and the graces propounded to us in Christ are what he needs, this I hold to be the true foundation of the spiritual edifice, with the strong a priori probability that flows in from one and three, on the correspondent historical evidence of two, no man can refuse or neglect to make the experiment without guilt. But four, it is the experience derived from a practical conformity to the conditions of the gospel, it is the opening eye, the dawning light, the terrors and the promises of spiritual growth, the blessedness of loving God as God, the nascent sense of sin, hated as sin, and of the incapability of attaining to either without Christ. It is the sorrow that still rises up from beneath, 
and the consolation that meets it from above, the bosom treacheries of the principal in the warfare, and the exceeding faithfulness and long-suffering of the uninteresting ally. In a word, it is the actual trial of the faith in Christ, with its accompaniments and results, that must form the arched roof, and the faith itself is the completing keystone. In order to an efficient belief in Christianity, a man must have been a Christian, and this is the seeming argumentum in circulo, incident to all spiritual truths, to every subject not presentable under the forms of time and space, as long as we attempt to master by the reflex acts of the understanding what we can only know by the act of becoming. Do the will of my Father, and ye shall know whether I am of God. These four evidences I believe to have been, and still to be, for the world, for the whole church, all necessary, all equally necessary. But at present, and for the majority of Christians born in Christian countries, I believe the third and the fourth evidences to be the most operative, not as superseding, but as involving a glad, undoubting faith in the two former, credidi, idioque, intellexi, appears to me the dictate equally of philosophy and religion, even as I believe redemption, to be the antecedent of sanctification, and not its consequent. All spiritual predicates may be construed indifferently as modes of action or as states of being, thus holiness and blessedness are the same idea, now seen in relation to act and now to existence. The ready belief which has been yielded to the slander of my potential infidelity, I attribute in part to the openness with which I have avowed my doubts, whether the heavy interdict under which the name of Benedict Spinoza lies is merited on the whole or to the whole extent. Be this as it may, I wish, however, that I could find in the books of philosophy, theoretical or moral, which are alone recommended to the present students of theology in our established schools, a few passages as thoroughly Pauline, as completely accordant with the doctrines of the established church, as the following sentences in the concluding page of Spinoza's Ethics. De inde quo mens hoc amore divino, seo beatitudine magis gaudet, eo plus intelligit, hoc est, eo majorum in affectus habet potentiam, et eo minus ab affectibus, qui malisunt patito, adque adeo ex eo, quod mens hoc amore divino, seo beatitudine gaudet, potestatem habet libidines co ascendi ad quia humana potentia ad co ascendos affectus in solo intellectu consistit ergo nemo beatitudine gaudet quia affectus co erquit sed contra potestas libidines co ascendi ex ipsa beatitudine orito with regard to the unitarians it has been shamelessly asserted that i have denied them to be christians god forbid for how should i know what the piety of the heart may be or what quantum of error in the understanding may consist with a saving faith in the intentions and actual dispositions of the whole moral being in any one individual. Never will God reject a soul that sincerely loves him, be his speculative opinions what they may, and whether in any given instance certain opinions, be they unbelief or misbelief, are compatible with a sincere love of God, God can only know. But this I have said, and shall continue to say, that if the doctrines, the sum of which I believe to constitute the truth in Christ, be Christianity, then Unitarianism is not, and vice versa, and that in speaking theologically and impersonally, i.e. of Silanthropism and Theanthropism, as schemes of belief, without reference to individuals who profess either the one or the other, it will be absurd to use a different language as long as it is the dictate of common sense, that two opposites cannot properly be called by the same name. I should feel no offence if a Unitarian applied the same to me, any more than if he were to say that two and two being four, four and four must be eight. Alla broton ton men, keneophrones alkai, exagathon ibalon, ton dao katamemphent agan, iskun okeon, parasphalen kalon, keros elkon apiso, thumas atalmos eon. This has been my object, and this alone can be my defence, and oh, that with this, my personal, as well as my literary life, might conclude. The unquenched desire, I mean, not without the consciousness of having earnestly endeavoured to kindle young minds, and to guard them against the temptations of scorners, by showing that the scheme of Christianity, as taught in the liturgy and homilies of our church, though not discoverable by human reason, is yet in accordance with it, that link follows link by necessary consequence, that religion passes out of the ken of reason, only where the eye of reason has reached its own horizon, and that faith is then but its continuation, even as the day softens away into the sweet twilight, and twilight hushed and breathless steals into the darkness, it is night, sacred night. The upraised eye views only the starry heaven, which manifests itself alone, and the outward beholding is fixed on the sparks twinkling in the awful depth, those suns of other worlds, 
only to preserve the soul steady and collected in its pure act of inward adoration to the great I am, and to the filial word that reaffirmeth it from eternity to eternity, whose choral echo is the universe. Theo, Mono, Doxa. End of chapter 24 End of Biographia Literaria